Hello. Sarah Thanks, Robert and Frank. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're really looking forward to your lecture. Uh, without further ado, let's begin your lecture. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. As has been said, my name is Sarah Trustman. And yes, I am dressed as an elephant. And there's a few reasons I dress as an elephant. One, it is very comfortable and I don't have to worry about what I'm gonna wear when I go to perform or lecture. The main reason though is because it's memorable. Uh, I probably am the first lecture you've gone to done by somebody wearing an elephant onesie. And down the road, even if you don't remember my name, which we were just talking about, you will remember, oh yeah, the elephant that I remember that talk. And um, when, when we got approached by Ted uh, to do TEDx in Atlantic, we, I was worried. I was like, well, do they realize like, you know, is this appropriate for the TED stage? <laughs> and they said, they were like, absolutely. Like that's why, you know, one of the things that grabbed our attention. And so that's one of the fundamentals of mnemonics that the, the third one that I'll get to in a little bit. But just going with that is, that's why I wear the elephant. And elephants are known to have an incredibly strong memory. So that's why I went with the elephant. And it's stuck and I love it. So I am, this is what I wear. And I it love, looks and comfortable. It, life easy. it is very comfortable. And it's, it's warm and if it's, you know, summer, I can push up my sleeves and so, and I have fun with it. I'm doing a Christmas show. So I've been thinking about how I'm gonna get my elephant dressed up for Christmas. Um, but I wanted, how many people do we have? I wanted to start with a version of, I'm closing the chat so I can see y'all a little bit better. So if there's something, Robert, that really I should address, you just jump in. Um, I'm gonna put everybody in gallery view. And if y'all wanna to go to gallery view too. And this will be interesting for me because I just popped in from another meeting where I just did another list. So we're gonna see how this- By the way, how gallery view is in the upper right-hand corner if you guys haven't figured that out yet. Uh, if you drag your mouse to the upper right-hand corner, you can click it from speaker to gallery view. If you click it to gallery view, you can see everybody at the same time. If you click it to speaker view, then it'll highlight Sarah only. And it looks like we have like 11 people with their screens on right now. If anybody else can turn their screen on, that would be awesome, but you don't have to. This can, it can totally be done with, with 10 or 11 or however many we have. Um, but if you can, it would be fun to add, add everybody in. So I am really excited because this is a variation of the amazing memory test, which I was, to those who were here before I was talking about, it's the very first glimpse into the power of mnemonics that I ever had. And so for seven years, I've been performing this in various scenarios in various ways. And then we started off performing on Zoom. And so I've really been working with a lot of different people, both mentalists and magicians, to figure out the best ways to present this in this medium. And I had such a wonderful idea given to me and I've only gotten to play with it one other time. So I thought that tonight, this might be a fun time to just run through it and play with it. And, and well, I'll have fun and then I will get to teaching. So what I'm gonna have you do is I'm gonna give you a countdown from 10. During those 10 seconds, I want you to find something in the room or the car or the wherever that it, without, without wrecking, I, um, that in some way brings you joy or represents you or says something about you. And it can be as goofy and silly as you want or as serious as you want, but you have 10 seconds to find it. When you come back, I want you to hold that, whatever that object is, right outside of the screen so that we can't see it, okay? All right, 10, nine, eight, seven, Six, five, four, three, two, one. All right. Awesome. Okay. Give me a thumbs up if everybody's good. 
Okay. So in a moment, I'm going to have everyone hold their objects up to the screen. And I want y'all to play along with me. I'm going to go through and most likely with Zoom, our screens are in different orders. So I'm going to go through and assign everybody a number and we're going to try to memorize their objects. And I want y'all to try to play along with me and just see how many of the objects you can remember. So when I say hold them up, everyone's going to hold up at the same time. Everyone should be un or muted, but just in case. Sometimes people hold up objects and I have no clue what they are. So to be prepared to unmute yourself, it is in the bottom left corner. You'll see the little mute button. So just know that I might go, hey, unmute, tell me what this is, because sometimes I have no clue. All right. And let's hold them up. Uh, I'm going to skip Joe for a second and go to... Okay. Oh, Joe has, is that a Sharpie? A pen. Joe has a pen at one. Oh, and hang on to your number. So remember what your number is. Oh, Jerry has a floating, is that a floating Christmas ornament or a floating orb? We'll go Sorry. with a floating orb is two. And three, we have Dave with a pack of cards. Four, I can't see what that is. Bruce, is that a light? Tic Tacs? This is that unmuting thing. It's the case for uh, ear pods. Oh, and uh, ear, ear, okay, ear pods. Yes. Okay, so that was five. And six, we have Robert with. Is it a book? A oh, DVD, a CD. Tron. Tron is six. And seven, we have a bunny coming out of the hat. Rick, do you have something? I can't tell what that is. You're going to have to let me know. Shampoo? Cam quarter. Okay. So seven. And we were at number Jesus, Sarah. seven. Cam quarter. Eight. We have another DVD. I'm just gonna go C D. And oh, that's Doug. Nine is CJ with a model car. And 10, <laughs> y'all all have electronic gadgets. I don't know what these are. Craig, you're gonna have to unmute for me. Let me know what, what 10 is. Hard drive. Hard drive, okay. 11 is J with a um, remote. 12 is Fred in the car. Oh, we're gonna go with a hand. <laughs> My wife. So twelve. Okay, twelve is a is Fred's wife. Got it. <laughs> Thirteen is a photo of a kid on the beach with a mom, and that's where we're gonna stop. That's everybody I got. I think. And I'm gonna be honest. I know that around. Seven and eight, I doubled up on numbers. So this will be extra fun to see how we do. All right. Um, Robert, throw me out some numbers. One through 13. Seven. Seven. And that's where we start, where I started doubling up. Because I know, Robert, you had the DVD, or Tron, but that was six. And so then seven was Bobby with the, um, the oh, don't show it. You can't show it until I say it. <laughs> That's Bobby with the hat and the rabbit. And then I think also I put at seven uh, Rick and, um, hmm. We'll come back to you, Rick. All right, give me another number. Three. 
three was Dave with the playing cards. A red back of bike, a pack of bikes, I think. It was kind of hard to see in my glare. Ah, pack of bike cigs. Awesome. I have my black stickers behind me. They're my favorite. Give me another. 13. <clears throat> 13 was the photo of um, the the mother and the child on the beach. That was, yep, Kurt. 10. 10. By the way, that, that, that child is. Hard drive. That, that child is 31 now. Huh, that's awesome. Didn't look 31. Ten is hard drive. Craig has a hard drive. Excellent. What? Oh, <clears throat> uh, nine. Nine was the remote. That and do you want, and I'll just run through and tell you what numbers we haven't done. Three. So one was pen. That was Joe. Two was a floating orb, and that was Gary. And three we did, that was cards. Four was what I thought was Tic Tacs, but it was not, um, the earbuds. And Bruce. And then this is where I jumped over and did crazy things with numbers. I don't know what I was doing, but um, we had Robert. You were either five or six, but you had Tron. And then we did all of our sevens, and eight, eight, I think we skipped eight because, oh, no, no, Doug was eight. We're going to come back to Doug and Craig. Nine, or did I do mess up things with numbers here, too, because I have... CJ with the car and Doug. This was another, this was a fun experiment. 12 was wife, Fred's wife. 11 was remote, we did that one. So that just leaves me with needing those two. Doug. Actually, that just leaves me with needing Doug, which I may have to come back to. But we'll go. We'll jump into the lecture, and I'll, I'll come back to that one and see how we do. We'll awesome. So we can go back to speaker view. All right. So thanks for letting me play with y'all. One thing I've realized that is slightly frustrating, but also very fun for me, is that there are two different modes, especially when it comes to memory. There's like teaching mode, and then there's performing mode. And if you are working on getting a memory path solid for performance, once you have established your memory path, and to those of you that that doesn't make sense, that will make sense in a moment. Once you've established what you're using for your base and your memory path, you don't want to change from that. You can make edits to strengthen things, but part of what I've been doing in rewriting the amazing memory test is correcting some of these locations that weren't super strong for me. And so in the amazing memory test download, instead of giving you one image for each number, sometimes I give multiple images for each number. And so what I'm finding is that that really enables people to get a path together great. But it means that I now have a path that has multiple locations to choose between. And that can get really tricky because then you're thinking. And when you're performing memory, you don't want to think. You want to like shut off all processing of I'm trying to remember this, I'm trying to do this, and instead just let it flow. I'll go back a little bit after we talk about um, the fundamentals and talk about how I did the memory test, that variation of it, which is not, I don't feel like a very good, like clean presentation of what it is, because I still am working with figuring out 
the different ways to do it on Zoom. Um, another way that I love is having people hold up cards and they'll write what they love on one side and what they hate on the other side. And then we flip the cards. Um, and so working with all of those various ways and trying to bring your audience in is something I really enjoy, but it can make it hard when you have dogs barking in the background and you have different people with different levels of clarity of their screens. And so especially with a crowd that isn't, so I've done it with people they, that they had, you know, some like really common objects, but then sometimes you're going, I have no idea what this is. And if the whole thing is people backing in and out of muting and unmuting to talk about what their object is, that can become slow for everyone too. So that's something you really have to like play with as you're doing it. But um, all of the mnemonics that I work with are based on the exact same three fundamentals. And we're talking a little bit, you know, in our pre-gathering about how we came up with the things that we did for the memory arts and then how I've continued to come up with what I do. And it is by always sticking to those three fundamentals. So a lot of people, when they think of mnemonics, they think of acronyms like Roy G. Biv or, um, you know, stories like, uh, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Never and those are soggy great. waffles. Never eat soggy waffles, exactly. Um, there's tons of those and they do work, but they're missing the number one fundamental of what really truly makes mnemonics strong. And that is edges. So everything that I do involves imagery. And at this time, Robert, if we want to go back to, oh, I say share screen. And now, there we go. All right. So for just a minute, I want y'all to just pause and go on a journey with me. And really take time to imagine being at these places while we go through them. Picture all the little details and then add your own if you want, if there's things that, that you, you want to add. So we're walking along, we come to this land and we see this huge tower standing in front of us. And from the bottom of the tower bursts this jack in the box. And the jack in the box is loud and cackling and you can hear the da 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 and he's obnoxious and annoying and you now have dirt in your face and on, in your teeth because of him bursting out of the ground. And his noise has scared a flock of doors. Now these doors had been perched up at the top of the tower. And we didn't notice them at first, but the noise of the jack scared them. And so all of a sudden these doors go flying in the air and they're flying by flapping and slamming open and shut and open and shut. And I'm trying to get the next one. There we go. If we keep walking past the tower, we come to a lake. And in that lake is a large and beautiful swan. But atop that swan's head, is the heaviest crown it has ever worn or that you have ever seen. And because the swan has this long skinny neck, holding that crown up is really hard. And so it's trying, but the crown keeps pushing its head back down. And so it's just having a rough time. What it's trying to do, if it wasn't for its crown, is eat these tiny shrews down in the, the bottom left corner in front of the swan. So as it's sitting there eating these shrews, the shrews are loud and complaining and they smell horrible. Even in the water of the lake, it's smelly and annoying and they're just complaining about being eaten, which I guess I get is something to be complained about, but at the same time, it's obnoxious. So we decide to move on and we come to two mountains. Atop the mountain to the left, there is a, the largest beehive ever. It is a huge like a mansion of a beehive. And there's this giant bee that is so proud of this beehive that is built atop this mountain. And to see this really well, you really have to crane your neck and like look up in the sky 
to imagine seeing this mountain. So when you're picturing the mountain, you're not just picturing it in the picture. You're really allowing yourself to be there and to see that bee so proud of its giant hive at the top of the mountain. And then from the behind the other mountains comes this light and these blaring horns. And it is a, I can't think of the word. I want to say a flock, but that's not right. But a flock of angels, that's what we're going to go with. And this flock of angels comes flying in and they're upset because the bee never got building permits. That he has broken universal building codes and the angels are coming down from heaven to let that bee have it because they are not happy that he has gone on and built this hive. Before things become too crazy and they get into too much of a fight, we keep moving and we find a stone hand. Stone hand is actually a giant that came up out of the ground and just as its hand was reaching out of the ground, it froze forever in stone. And one of the shrews has gotten away from that swan with the heavy crown. And so she's resting underneath the hand in the shadows, but she's still sweaty and she still smells and she is still complaining. I mean, that is just all she does is grumble and complain. And her smell is so bad that the banshees that were perched atop the fingers go flying into the air. And as banshees go flying, they scream this howling, horrible scream. And you have to cover your ears because it is so loud and the smell is so bad. So we keep moving and we come to a waterfall. And at the waterfall, a giant sign pops up and says, stop, because this is a doors only party. Those doors that flew away from the top of the um, tower have now come to rest at the bottom of the waterfall and they are having an awesome party, but we are not allowed to join them. So these images are, let's see, I'm trying to decide if I want to stop sharing or I'll just keep talking from here for a second. These images are our locations. And that's the second fundamental of mnemonics. So the first is images. If you think about when you're born, you're not born knowing how to speak. You're not born knowing how to read, how to write. But the first thing you start to do is process your world visually. You're taking everything in around you and your brain is learning to understand things visually. So images. The second thing our brain is taking in from the moment we're born is space, where we are spatially, where location, where we exist in the world around us. And so giving our images locations, giving them a place in space, it's like a mental filing system. So this goes back to, well, we say that this goes back to a guy named Simonides, but the truth is that people have been using mnemonics and storytelling and art as, as storytelling long before even the written word. Language was developed because of mnemonics, written language, that is. Um, so we don't talk much about that, but we like to go back to this guy named Simonides, and I think part of it is because it's a fun story. He was at a dinner party with a bunch of people and got called out he went out and the building collapsed, crushing everyone beyond recognition. Their families wanted to come and collect the bodies to be able to properly mourn them, but they didn't know who they were. So Simonides realized that he could remember where each person was sitting in the table around him. And so that was the first development in kind of the modern world, the, in the, um, the world of writing where these connections were made that, oh, if we can visualize something and then we know where it is in space, our brain automatically holds onto that information without having to try. The third thing, well, here, we'll jump to, well, I wanna know, Ah, uh, shoot. This isn't working because of me having to be the one to screen share. So 
I will, I'm going to, I'm just switching orders of a couple of things. Really. Location is how we establish the suits. And that's what the memory arts did really differently. What I've just, that story we just went through is the first five cards of Mnemonica and the first five cards of Aronson. And we have given them locations. That look like numbers. So your tower looks like the number one. The swan looks like a number two. I hear my daughter whispering outside the door. My mom is blah, blah, blah. I don't know what she's saying about me. The mountains, if you twist them to the side, which I guess I could do in here. The, oh, nope, I can't, just kidding. <laughs> they look like a three. The hand, obviously, do you see, does everybody see the four? I don't have as many people. Let's see, ooh, can I do that with the gallery? And then maybe I can see more of y'all. And then we have five for the waterfall. So if you can trace the five and see where that is. So those are your locations. And then the cards we have translated into images. And I'm not gonna go through and teach you all of the cards right now, but I'll go through and show you the ones that we've, we've used for these first five. Jack in the box, I'm assuming everyone can guess what card the Jack in the box represents. The Jacks. Door is four, has four sides, rhymes. So those doors represent the fours. A crown for kings and shrew is two. So I like to picture her kind of kneeling over and looking kind of like the number two, but the rhyme is what helps there too. Hive is five. It's our giant beehive that represents a five. And your angels from heaven, heaven, seven. So anytime you see the angels, you think of heaven and know that they represent a seven. We have a shrew again, two, and our banshee is three. And if you look at the banshee, if it was flying to the side, you see it kind of makes the three shape. And when you're talking about how the banshees and the um, angels can kind of mix up because they, they both are flying and they're both like human-esque figures. And so I give, I make the banshees very dark in my mind and the angels very light and bright. And that helps tell the two apart. The banshees also are always screaming and howling and it hurts my ears. Whereas the angels, while they're loud, they're loud with their trumpets and it's not is um, harsh of a noise. Door again, four. And then our stop sign is nine. So now you know what the cards are. Well, you know the values, but you don't know the suits. And that's what I was getting ready to show you. We set up the suits as locations on each location. So you have clubs, diamonds, hearts, spades. If you're reading like, like you're reading them, they're in alphabetical order. But if you go counterclockwise, it's chased. So depending on which method you prefer. I have found for me though, that I don't even think about that. For me, it's very easy to just always picture the diamonds up there, always picture the hearts down there, always picture the spades down in the bottom digging and the clubs are always there. And there is something about the way they're laid out with the hearts and the clubs being both the rounded, but then the heart and the spade on the bottom, they just fit together very well. And so for me, it's, I don't even think about it as much as it is just a visual cue. Where I have to think more is actually telling myself a club is a club, which is something I've struggled with since I was a kid. <laughs> like, um, so 
going back and looking at what we know or what we just talked about. Before I move to the next slide, I want, can I get this bigger so I can see more of y'all? Looking at the first image, what, um, can somebody, oh, I don't wanna make y'all all on mute. Raise your hand if you know what the first, these two cards are now that we've gone through and talked about it. Awesome. We have our four of clubs and our nine of spades. No. Oh, yeah, yeah. Jack of spades. Jack of spades, Jack of spades, sorry. So what that is, is your smaller multiple image is one stack. Your large single image is the other stack. So you have mnemonica represented by the small doors. And then you have Aronson represented by the large jack. So the first card in Aronson is the jack of spades. And then the first card in Monica is the four of clubs. Oh, I didn't want to go ahead to the second one. Take a moment to think in your mind and raise your hand if you know what the second location is, like where the second place we go is. From the tower, if you picture the number two in your mind, if you know where we went next to the swan. And then take a moment to remind yourself what, ha what was happening at the swan. And don't try to necessarily like translate or think, but just like what was going on there? Crown on her head. Uh-huh. And the banshees. Yep. So that crown is in the club spot. It was it's our large card, so it's Aronson. And then our banshees are in our heart spot. So it's no, the three of hearts. Shrews. Uh, yes, yeah, see, <laughs> our shrews, our twos <laughs> are in the heart spot. And that is our mnemonica stack. So what happens is that the main number that you see, it represents the card number. Yes, that it is, is your one, stack two. location. And in the in, in this one you see the number one in the distance meaning that you're leaving the number one call yes so what this has done is combined several methods you're doing a journey and so you're thinking through this one long storyline and so they're connected but then you also have the numbers so you're getting used to picturing the numbers representing your stack location and then you have your card characters. And the reason I teach it this way and don't tell y'all before I show you is because what I've found is that if you say, this is what I'm gonna teach you, you immediately are going, I have to learn something. I have to try, I have to think like, instead of just enjoying the journey and letting your brain take in the story and what's going on there and then realizing, oh, I know this. This, I do actually know this. So if you think about going next, you picture the three, and that is the mountains. So now take a moment to think about what's happening at the mountains. We have our hive, large, which is five, and it is in our club spot. So our Aronson card, at location three is the five of clubs. Yeah, five of clubs. And then you have the angels coming in in the diamond spot. They're small and multiple, so we know it's mnemonica. And the way that I keep those apart, because we debated for a while as far as which should be which, um, alphabetically, Aronson comes first, so it's large. But if you also think about the first letters of Aronson, it, you just have the A, but with mnemonica, you have that M and then that N. 
So you have like lots of little multiple humps. And so that's how, why, how I remember that it's your small multiple is what represents Demonica. So seven of diamonds. So take a moment to think about what number four was on our journey. And I'm going to let you know it was the hand. And then you want to think about what's happening at the hand. Resting beneath the hand is our shrew. And she is in our heart spot. Two of hearts. Aronson, card number four. Banshees are three. And they're in our club spot. So those banshees flying away lets us know the mnemonica card four is the three of clubs. One of my favorite locations is the waterfall at five. Um, I like to he I hear it when I get there. It's bubbling and I hear the doors like kind of slamming, but they're not this loud slamming like they were when they were flying. And that big giant stop sign that pops up and tells us to stop. So nine of spades is your fifth card of Aronson. And then four of hearts is your fifth card for Mnemonica. And I'm going to stop screen sharing and go back to, there we go. Oh, this is so much better. I like that so much better than having, like trying to see y'all tiny and, and get an idea of, of what you're thinking. At any point in time, if you have some of this stuff, I may say, oh, wait just a minute, I'll get there. But if you have a question that you're like, I have no idea, let me know, unmute and just say, quick question. Um, I said that after this part, because really I didn't want y'all to know what we were doing as we went through. Um, just by a show of hands, as you started going through, and we've now gone through the path a couple times, take a moment to just go one, two, three, four, five, and move from your tower to the swan, to the mountains, to the hand, to the waterfall. And then once you go back through another time, take a second to think about what's happening at each of those places. So the ultimate translation, that's what takes the most for me, the most practice, because so much of it is layered and hopefully intuitive that you don't have to really work to memorize it. It's more of just getting it so that you see a banshee and you immediately go three and that those things become synonymous in your mind. And um, uh, I'm trying, so since we spoke before, was most everyone here before we really, really started this? Because I don't want to repeat some of the stuff that I said before. I want to make sure that, that we get moving through. But at the same time, I don't want to miss things that are important. Um, the third fundamental of mnemonics is emotion. And so this is where you get to play. If tonight you go back and you're laying in bed and you go through one through five in your head and there's a story that doesn't stick with you or there's a character that doesn't stick with you, add emotion to it. Add uh, your senses to it. So think all five senses. Can you smell it? Can you hear it? Can you taste it? Like I always get that dirt taste in my mouth when I get to that first location and the jack pops up and there's dirt getting thrown in my face. So really involve yourself like you are an active participant in each of those locations. Um, one of the things that I talked about a little bit with those that were here earlier is that I would like, I wish that each group of 10 had a more central theme. So I would recommend if you are sitting down and using the memory arts for the first time to memorize a stack, that when you get into the 30s, imagine them all underwater and think thirsty Thursdays. 
thirsty thirties. And I am a huge advocate of taking a Sharpie and sharpening up what you're doing and draw water on, on it, add seaweed, whatever it is that you need to do to make that location feel underwater for you. And then do the same thing in the 40s, but make them in space. Because what I found once you get into those higher numbers is that they are easier to mix the 30s and the 40s or even sometimes the 20s. And so giving the 30s that specific I'm underwater theme and then giving the 40s that specific I'm in space theme will help you tell those apart. Another thing that um, we show in the book, and then I will switch from cards and start talking about other ways to incorporate this, but we talk about um, the Finaglian grid. And that's something that I get a lot of contact, people contacting me about because they haven't really seen it before, but it's Finagles. And what it has done is ultimately in the book, we teach you 52 locations. And then you can store two cards at each location. We also write it so that if you wanted to read it just for Mnemonica, you could, or you could read it just for Aronson if you wanted to just memorize one stack. But what I'm hoping y'all found as we went through these five first locations is that having them interact with each other actually makes the story stronger. So when I say it's actually easier to memorize two stacks than one, it really is true because you have this interactive activity happening at each location. And um, you can build upon that. I think for me, ideally three is like the right number. Um, you can do four and we've had up to six on this path, but it got very cluttered. So drops it back down to four. And then really I like working with, with three. Um, they just, they fit really well. And for that third stack, what we do, and their uh, Vanishing has a download for it, but if you have the memory arts, I will, I'm happy to send out that download because that's something we just did as a gift to those that had purchased the book. Um, we irradiated the characters. So we have characters that have been through like an atomic blast and they're all the same. So it's still your Jack in the box. It's still the shrew is still too, but now the shrew is actually the animal shrew. She's wearing the same clothes, but she's grown hair and looks like the little, the little animal. Um, so that's how we tell the third character apart. So using your imagination and adding anything you want to help tell these apart, do it. If there is a card character, so we give a card key, if there's a card character that doesn't fit or click, edit it, add it, change it. But once you've changed it and once you've said, this is what I'm using, use that. So there's like the little bit of play time you have at the beginning. And the way I like to think of that is like, whatever your mind gravitates towards first, use it. If you go through and you practice and something doesn't click your first run through, think about, okay, what can I add to that location or to that character, to that scene, to make it funny, to make it sexual, to make it graphic, to make it obscene, to make it gory, anything that's gonna give you a gut reaction. So how can you flip it up? You don't wanna go with what's normal. You don't wanna go with what's regular. You want to go with something completely odd and out of the ordinary. So back to the Finaglian grid. That is taking all 52 locations and putting them into a grid like so. And so it gathers all of one through nine in the center. And then all of your tens are on one wall, your twenties, thirties, forties, and then Finagle designed it for 50. So what we suggest is just that you add 51 and 52, or you can connect 50, have them all together on the ceiling. And I'm gonna grab something that's just right over out of my reach. Okay. So this is the Finaglian grid and it's torn up because I use it a lot. I need to print another one and it's upside down. There we go. This is the Finaglian grid with 
the locations. So you see you have your tower, Swan 2, Mountain 3, Hand 4, Waterfall 5. And then you keep going. We have a Whirlpool for 6, a Giraffe for 7, a Headless Snowman for 8, and a tunnel with a path leading up to it for nine. So the reason I have this is because what you want to imagine is that that finaglian grid is folded like this and then placed in your room. So in that way, you can use these 50 or 52 locations in as many rooms as you want. So this, I'm throwing a lot on you guys because I know there's some of y'all here that have already been really working with this and I want to make sure that I'm giving you new things to chew on. But I know that there's some people that this is your first time looking at this. And so just know that this step is like the next step. <laughs> once you have your path down and once you're really pleased with those, like then you, then you can do you don't need to know this to memorize a stack is my point. But what I really like about this for memorizing a stack is because now you imagine sitting in the middle of your floor and you're actually sitting right on top of, I'm upside down again. You're actually sitting right on top of the waterfall. And then if you look on the floor in front of you, imagine the swan. And then since we're imagining sitting like this, if you look on the floor in the front, kind of up to your left, you see that tiny tower. And then on the wall to your left, you imagine all of your locations that are in the tens. So we have two pillars for 11, a butterfly for 13. But then what you can do is, so the pillars, if I was to imagine the pillars up here on my wall, realizing you can't see the corner that I'm pointing to, I would incorporate whatever's on my wall with those pillars. And so then I could take this same path and put it in my kitchen. And then when I look up on that wall in my kitchen, if it's my pantry up there, I'm incorporating that location with my pantry. So it gives you options to, you can have, so I store um, cards in my old office. That's where my finagling grid of cards are. And then the presidents I store in the living room. So it's the same path, but that path is now, I imagine it in my living room and it stores different information. So that's how you can, we were talking about this idea of paths within paths and Jerry, you were talking about like, it really can be unlimited. It can be because you can, from there, you could even just, you could say at the tower, I now imagine going inside the tower. And inside the tower, there is a room made of stone because I am in the tower. And then you could have your grid, your finagling grid in that stone room in the tower. And that is where you store whatever information it is that you want to store there. So that is a quick introduction to the memory art system for memorizing cards, which hopefully also gives you a really deep look into that those three fundamentals of mnemonics, which is images, make it visual, give it a location, and then make it crazy. Make it something that gives you emotion, that jumps out at you. Any questions so far? So I have a question. Yes. Uh, do you also have uh, images for the letters of the alphabet? Yes. Well, I actually have not created my own alphabet yet, but um, I like Lynn Kelly's and it's in her book, um, Memory Craft. And so, although She's from Australia. And so some of her, like she uses some characters that I think are 
are, you know, stories from her childhood and things like that, that aren't necessarily characters that I would first use. So creating one of my own is something that I have on my list of things to create. But it's something that you certainly could sit down and say, okay, what's the first animal that comes to my mind with an A? And then picture that animal either curled in the shape of an A. So if it's an alligator, it could be standing in this weird shape that get, and then with its tail up to give the cross of the A. Um, think of the first animal that makes you think of B. I think of bees, bumblebees. So you could see two bumblebees on top of each other making the shape of a bee with their wings. And so it's definitely, you don't have to draw these things out. You don't have to be able to draw. You don't have to be able to be artistic. If you want to draw them out, that's great because you're taking time and thinking about it. But as long as you understand what it is, you're good. You don't need it. No one else needs to understand what it is. Um, and if you want to just picture it in your mind, that's, that is just as good. As long as you're really taking time to imagine being there until you get those locations strong. The amazing mem amazingest memory test is something that I have taught always after teaching a stack. You can play the amazing memory. You can do the amazingest memory test with these locations. So you could say at um, location two, Jerry, you had your, your floating orb. And so you could imagine the swan trying to bat the floating orb down every time. But the truth is that I have a completely different path that I use for the amazingest memory test. And it is based on Corinda's path um, and the 13 steps to mentalism. Corinda, a lot, a lot of people have recommended even like Al Baker is another huge inspiration for what the amazingest memory test can be to me. But um, he suggests translating the numbers to letters, and then you create words based on those letters, and that's making a peg system, which is essentially another variation of the memory path. But it requires a lot of that translation of going, okay, wait, which that number equals that letter. Okay, but that letter, what's my word for that letter? What Corinda did was he just took words that rhymed. One is gun, two is shoe, three is tree, four is door, five is hive, six is sticks, so on and so forth. So when we created our character key, so the character key is our card characters, we kind of used Corinda's characters to an extent, changing obviously some of them. So ace is face, which also can be sun one son. So those are kind of interchangeable. Um, but what you do for the amazingest memory test is usually if it was performed in the world, you would just have your audience members call out items. And it can get really fun because they'll start to kind of snowball off of each other and you can see it's going in a certain direction and you can play with that and you can really work off of the audience and that that level of, of audience interaction and it can get hilarious. It also puts you at a subtle advantage because when you're doing the amazing memory test, you want to kind of shut off your eyes and just be thinking in your head. So one of the things that I teach when you do the amazingest memory test, if you're doing it in a live scenario, is having a chalkboard behind you and you have someone who's writing the list. And that's really fun because you can memorize it faster than they can write. So then you have that tension you can play with. Um, and the audience who's memorizing along with you is looking at the list, which makes them feel like they have an advantage. But the truth is, seeing the list while trying to memorize the list is actually harder. It's so much easier. I mean, performing the memory test blindfolded is like the ideal scenario because literally you're just closing your eyes and then you're going through your, your imagination. Um, although to the audience, it makes it seem 
more complicated. So um, it's finding ways to hook those objects to those locations. And you want to do that immediately and, and just whatever sticks first. And you want to have a specific action that you have always paired with those locations. So for the path that I use, it's like I said, different than this one for the amazing memory test with one being gone, I imagine whatever it is is being shot at my face. Two is shoe, I'm trying to stick my foot in a shoe and whatever it is, is keeping my foot from going in. And that's the same action I do every single time so that you don't have to think. Because as soon as you think, that's when you run into trouble. As soon as you're trying to go, oh, I've got to memorize this. All you wanna be go thinking about is the number, you pull up the image the, of that number in your head, then when you hear the object, you're throwing it on visual, like throwing it onto your picture visually. So I really like this idea of playing with people bringing objects from the home and bringing objects from around them. And depending on your audience, it can get really fun, especially I, I had somebody the other day that had a, um, a pig spatula. <laughs> and again, this is only my second time doing it. So doing it that way. Um, but it, as you see, can get complicated when you don't necessarily see what their objects are. And so a recommendation that I'm learning to have in there is make it something that we can tell what it is. And it is, can be fun if you have one person whose object you can't figure out what it is. But if every single person you're having to go through and say, what's your object, what's your object, what's your object, that is not impressive. Because you want speed. You want to be moving through so quickly that you you've just lost everyone else in the dust. And then you don't tell the audience that you're going to be memorizing by the numbers. Because even if you do a list of 10, the average person can remember seven things. But they don't remember those seven things connected to each number. They are just going to remember, oh yeah, there was something, but I don't remember exactly where it was. So then being able to recall those with numbers immediately throws your audience off because they're thinking, oh, I'm going back to number one. And when they go back to number one, that's not where you're going. When you jump somewhere else, it throws the whole thing off. And so it helps lose your audience. With um, things like the amazing memory test, where you're memorizing different things every time you're performing and you're doing it live, you want to give some time in between your performances or you want to have multiple lists and multiple actions lined up so that you're not mixing those items. You can have what's called ghosting. You can go through and clear your path. So if you want to memorize, let's say you don't want to memorize Aaron's and Monica, and now you have every time you go to the tower you see that jack-in-the-box and the doors flying away and you don't want to see those cards there because you want to learn something else. Imagine going through and exploding them. The jack-in-the-box explodes and bursts into flames and is burned and is gone. The doors are bursting into flames and falling down as ashes. And that way what happens is even if you have ghosting, you then immediately go, oh, but I destroyed that, so I moved to the next thing that I kept there. And so that helps with that potential overlap and problem. Um... The other thing I wanted to talk about is an overlap of lots of different things. The, one of the biggest questions I get asked is, how can I use mnemonics to memorize my pattern, to memorize my script, to memorize my show order? And there are definitely ways, and we will talk about those. But I have, um, I was a theater major. I've been performing since I was four. And before I even started using mnemonics to memorize my scripts, I would be given a two-page Shakespearean monologue. And they would say, all right, know this by the morning and be able to perform it. And it wasn't just me that would be able to know it and perform it. Everybody in the class could do it. And it seemed impossible. But the way we were able to do it is through something called the Stanislavski method. And so you go through and you break down every little chunk of what you say into 
not even sentences, but like parts of sentences were, you know, little chunks. And you give each part of those intention. You give them an action, you give them purpose. So thinking about purpose and then a, giving an action word to each of those things. And so then what happens is everything you were saying has a reason for being said. Your mind logically moves to the next part of your pattern, the next part of your trick, because naturally that's what should be said next, because there's reason behind all of it. And that falls under this list that I've created called my erdisms. And one of the other things I've done is I worked for over a year on um, an Erdnay's graphic novel. And that is another story for another day. But working on that project had me read Erdnay's Expert at the Card Table like six times in a row. And then I was reading it in two different versions while also editing. So I like really devoured this text down to like the tiniest level. And there were certain things that were mentioned over and over and over again. And those things I hear mentioned in every single great magic text, modern to whenever. It's these basic principles that you hear mentioned over and over again. And one of the number one is purpose. When you're doing anything in magic, it should all have purpose. Every word you say should have a reason for being said. Every move you make should have a reason for being made. And every non-move you make should have a reason for not being made. And if there's something you're doing or there's something you're saying that doesn't fit within your giant purpose, your macro purpose, or fit within the micro purpose of what you're doing at that moment, take it out or change it. And doing those things will help you have, think about the reason behind why your show moves from one part to another, to the next, to the next, because you're putting purpose behind it. And so from there, you don't even really need to have a set you don't need to sit down and memorize on a path because you've put so much thought into why you're doing what you're doing that you naturally do it. With that being said, using a memory path is an amazing tool for memorizing anything you have to say or do because you just put each chunk on a different section. So whenever we get a new big speech or like when we did the TED talk, Every single paragraph be like broken down into paragraphs like those. And then next to each of those paragraphs, we would draw the location. So next to the first paragraph, the first thing I want to say, I'll draw the tower. And then whatever, there's two different lines of thought. I'll tell you both and then I'll tell you my preference, but I'll let you choose your own because with mnemonics, it's to each his own. It's what works for you. So you can either, whatever that first word is, you can attach that word to that location. Instead though, I like thinking about the entire meaning of that little chunk of text. And so if first I want to know that I'm going to perform the amazingest memory test at the tower, I would imagine the tower performing the amazingest memory test. And if second, I know that I want to talk about the fundamentals, I would have my swan building blocks, because I always think of building blocks with the fundamentals. And that would remind me of, oh yeah, fundamentals, that's what I'm talking about next. And so you can have those cues that if you get lost in like the big picture of where you are, you just go, wait, where was I last? Oh yeah, I was at the mountains. So now I go to the hand, what's at the hand? And so that gives you this kind of fallback that if you've done your work up into your performance so that you've put purpose into everything and thought into why everything's happening when it's happening. But then on top of that, you have your path built in on everything. So if you know you're gonna do a certain 
you know, card effect first, you could put that on the tower. And again, you have to figure out what works for you because you might find that, well, I want to know the order of my set. And once I get into each different performance, like I know what I'm saying, but you might also, you might be somebody that says, no, I need to know every little bit written out. And so you figure out what works best for you and then take those locations and attach them to the information held there in some way visual. Another great thing to do is like taking notes, drawing and doodling. So I was working with someone the other day on an effect that I is completely out of my wheelhouse and what I usually do. And so I started drawing and I had all of these steps. And so as they're telling me the steps and maybe this person is in this group, maybe they're not, I'm right, I'm drawing out all of these things so that when I went by myself to run through this incredibly long routine with all these tiny steps, I'm just picturing in my mind where I'm going on this drawing that I drew. So for example, you could make a block turnover into a casserole dish filled with blocks. And, um, a Jordan count, I think of like the Sea of Jordan or, or the Jordan. I always just pictured, I pictured the ocean and um, like this kind of desert area with, with the lake. Uh, Elmsley count, you pick, I picture an elm tree. And so you have all of these different ways to connect words to pictures. And then when you put those pictures together in that order, you're telling a story. And that story is what your brain holds on to. Um, Robert, what time did we end up actually starting? Uh, 7 an p.m. an hour and nine minutes ago. Okay. Um, so talking about those, er going back to the erdisms, the value of a partner and ally. Um, never trust in your own work always get the opinion of another. That to me is such an important thing and something that I think most everyone here values because we're all here online working with other people and having those groups that we share and show things with. That is so important. I saw something the other day by a performer that's been performing a very long time and I was very disappointed. And I said, I just don't understand. How, how have you been doing this for so long and think that it's, it's good. And it's because so often we get in our bubbles where we're just telling everybody, oh, that's great, oh, that's great. Oh, I love it, that's so amazing. And constructive criticism when in the right group is such a valuable thing. So plugging in with a group of magicians that do the type of magic that you do, or even better, plugging in a magician, with magicians that do all different types of magic because it just opens your mind to all these different things that can be applied across different areas. But getting that outside opinion and that feedback and having people that can say, oh yeah, that didn't work. Um, for Raleigh Magic Club, I made critique sheets. And so anytime we perform, everyone gets, and even if it was just like, a, I'm gonna try this, like I did with the Amazingest Memory Test, and I'm like, you guys, this is something I'm still working through, so let's just see how it goes. Everybody gets a critique sheet and it tells, you get to write where you were sitting. And so if you flashed, you know, you, oh, you flashed at this moment or whatever. And so they know what, what angles they need to work on. Um, and then it talks about, did my pattern make sense? Did, was it, did it gel and all work together? Did it have purpose? And then I also include on the critique sheet, well, this is my favorite thing. This is what I really liked because I think it's important when critique to always make sure that we are pointing out the good things too, because every bad thing you say is going to sound so much heavier than the good things you say. But I do think it's so important that we hold each other accountable and that when we see people doing things that are almost great, but not great, that we say, oh, it's not quite there. What about this? And, and we work on it. And then that when we receive those critiques, we take them with open minds, realizing that we might not want to do everything, every critique 
you know, some people will critique you and say, oh, I think you should do this. And you're like, no, there is a clear reason I don't do that. But not shutting that person down because their input teaches something, whether it's teaching you, it might not teach you something, but it's a chance to then teach them something. So regardless, there's this sharing of knowledge that happens. It's building us up as a group to the world that's looking in and makes all of us look better. Um, purpose, all action must have purpose. We've talked, talked about that with, that's such an important thing with memory. Um, all your words have purpose. All of everything you do has purpose. Um, Yes, Dave, you don't have to use all of it. Absolutely. Uh, patter should be treated as monologue. And this is kind of a personal pet peeve of mine. I feel like when we call what we do patter, it makes it seem unimportant. And even if you're not scripting everything you say, you still should think through everything you say and still should make sure that everything, again, has purpose. And that is just as important as learning your slights. Yes, you want your moves to be perfunctory. You want to be able to perform and do whatever it is that you're doing and hiding or not doing. You want to be able to do that without thinking. But what you're saying, you should always be thinking about. The moment you're saying things and your words have become so that they can be mindless, you know you've got to switch things up because that's the point that it gets boring for your audience. But because at that point, you're not thinking there is no purpose. You are not, you're just this. I got in a wonderful discussion with somebody the other day about memorizing their lines. And they were saying that they like to listen to their lines over and over again until they can just say them without thinking. And then that's when they start studying the script. And that, as a theater nerd, just hit such a chord with me. It really upset me because I was like, that's so much time wasted. All that time that you're sitting there listening to these lines over and over and over again and not thinking about them, just trying to like bang them into your head is time you could be thinking about why you're saying what you're saying and how to say what you're saying. And is there a better way to convey what I wanna be saying? And who am I as I'm saying this? And so all of that time that you are actually memorizing what it is that you're saying, it's time for you to develop who you are. And if you're just a magician doing magic cause you like magic and want to show magic, that's cool. But that should be your purpose throughout. That should be what covers everything you do. Uh, practice over skill, hard work and practice for the win every time. Um, you have people that are skilled. Those people that are hard workers are going to outwork them in the long run. Um, and that, that's something I think most people in this group already know. Mental rehearsal can be as valuable as physical rehearsal. Science actually backs this up now. Um, so this is something that Erdnays talked about. And there have been experiments where they have had people learn songs on the piano and then practice them just in their mind to just imagine that they're playing them and think about the chords and then have people also actually learning them by physically going in and playing. And they were amazed to find that imagining and going through and really thinking about what you're doing was almost as strong as actually doing it. And so that's part of also with this idea of memory and what you're doing in your mind is realizing how strong your brain is. And so if you don't have cards with you, but you want to practice something, go through it in your head and imagine doing those moves. Ima think about what it is and where your hands are and what each, each of those minute details about what you're doing. Thinking through those things and doing them in your mind can be just as valuable as actually physically doing them. Success depends on avoiding or allaying suspicion. I love that one. All senses matter. Detail, detail, detail. This is important for performers, for magicians, and especially for mnemonists. All of those senses. When you're thinking about your audience and you're performing something, think about what are they hearing? What 
it's not just what they're seeing. It's what, can they smell something? What other ways can you involve their senses in what you are doing so that it becomes a fully immersive experience? The same thing when you're memorizing things. The more you can think about what does it sound like? What does it feel like? What does it taste like? What does it smell like? All of those things are gonna trigger different parts of your brain and help you recall that information better. Simplicity. And I love having those two next to each other. Detail, 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 and then simplicity. Which brings me back to one of my favorite things that Al Baker says. He talks about adding, like adding simplicity and or, or seeking simplicity in order to add complexion. And I feel like only in, uh, me not memory, only in magic is it that simplicity makes complex. And that is such a beautiful thing to play with. Um, it's one of, it's like my, it's why I love magic is the idea of making it as simple as possible. And that's also what I, I've striven, stri I'm striving to do with all of my mnemonic endeavors is how do we make this as simple as possible so that you're not having to memorize and translate and do all of this extra. You just have the story you tell and then that tells you what you need to know. How can you break it down in the simplest method possible? If you can't improve the method, improve the moment. The value of while and as. I went through and circled every single time that Ernay said while or as. Do this while doing this. Do this as you're doing this. I mean, Dave Ernay, that's a, you all know that that's such an important, important concept in magic. And to always be thinking about how can I layer these things and while incorporating a purpose. The necessity of uniformity which is one I'm working on with something I'm doing that I'm having a tricky time with the necessity of uniformity. It is better to do something slow and equal than it is to do something quickly with, with pauses and breaks. Um, regular time and movement is always going to be greater than speed. Strive for perfection, but never let failure stop you. Um, one of my favorite things that SWE says, I say they practice what they preached. This, I'm talking about the open shift, is another outcome of our constant but ever failing efforts to devise a perfect shift. And I think when it comes to creation and creating new things um, in any manner, so many times, the destination is not where you expected to go. And I'm gonna end with showing y'all uh, my night's tour because it is such a perfect example of starting somewhere and I had no idea where I was gonna end up. And so I'm just excited to be able to bring y'all in and share part of that journey with you. So take time as you're working on things to think about. I, I like to think about all my projects as being lazy Susans. And so I'm surrounded by lazy Susans that are always twisting at different speeds. And as parts of those lazy Susans get closer to me and so I'm working on all these things, these different ideas touch at different places, which spark new ideas. And so thinking about the chessboard, which has nothing to do with memory anymore and is memoryless. But at the same time, thinking about mnemonics, they all teach me different things that work together and the overlaps and things that I discover because of working on multiple projects at once that I'm going through and thinking about at the same time. I, I always really encourage everybody work on two things at a time so you can plot back and forth between the two. And then enjoy thinking about those two things simultaneously and seeing those connections. Uh, which also goes back to an ancient uh, mnemonic idea called the Lillian wheel, which was back in the 1200s and then was made popular again by Giordano, Giordano, Giordano Bruno. 
it's late here, you guys. I'm tired. <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, but Giordano Bruno, he took the lolly and wheels, which are essentially like a finaglian grid, taking all of your locations, but putting them in a wheel instead of a square. And so those wheels can move and they touch at different points. So what I love about memorizing a stack and putting it in your room like this is that every time you want one of the threes, it's in the exact same spot on the wall. Every time you want one of the fives, it's in the exact same spot on the wall. And so what happens is this allows your brain spatially to recognize where your cards are in a way that's a little more manageable than one long string of 52 things. So now it's seeing 52 things and seeing the correlations between the numbers, which then gives you correlations between the locations. And so there are connections that your brain is able to make that otherwise I think would most likely be missed and you, unless you were directly taught them. And even then, I, the full understanding oh. of putting, oh. was that a question or, or just noise? I'm gonna go with just noise. So being able to know that Oh, well, if I want, try to make sure I'm on the right page, 25 and 45, they're going to be right on the middle of my wall. And then if I want 10 or 15 and 35, also going to be right in the middle of my wall. And so it puts order and organization to things in ways that subconsciously your brain is able to digest them and make connections that you might not have made otherwise. Going back to um, my lazy seasons of projects and thinking about this lolly and wheel that brings these different ideas back together, sometimes the journey is just as important as the destination. And those are essentially kind of the same, you know, never letting failure stop you and keep striving for, for, for perfection. And even once you feel that you've reached perfection, strive to perfect that perfection <laughs> and enjoying every step of that journey and allowing yourself to deviate from maybe your original path or your original plan because you may discover something on that journey that you didn't know you could discover. It's hard to discover things that you don't know exist. Um, so I am just making sure that I covered all of the main things. I do have, but I wonder, I, I feel silly almost with this group teaching some of these things that I was going to show y'all, but I'm going to go on and show you anyways, and we'll, we'll, push through it and then y'all can just let me know if like, if you want me to slow down and explain something in more detail. Dave, we were talking about SIGs earlier. I got my, my black SIGs right here. And what I've done with these cards, I'm gonna talk about two of my favorite shuffles. My favorite fall shuffle. So I've just taken these and I've put them in order. So all the jacks are together and 10 signs and we go through all of them. All of them. So as I'm talking about all of these ideas coming together into one thing, this shuffle is a perfect example of so many of these different ideas coming together. There is one shuffle that Erdne says, do not do because it looks horrible. That is the shuffle I want. Because I, my purpose is not to be a wonderful manipulator of cards. My purpose is not to seem incredibly skilled at anything other than memory. So I want a shuffle that looks horrible. So I like the, I think I to move my food that I stopped eating right before this out of the way. 
I love the Charlie A. Hamo shuffle. And for me, it is so simple to remember because literally you just take off some of the cards. It doesn't matter how many you take off. And then you're putting the top on the bottom and the bottom on the top. Top on the bottom, bottom on the top. Just Lift your hands it. a little higher. I can do it again. And so what you have is that you'll have to do a cut to bring yourself back, but all of your cards are in their original order. So I'll move it down a little bit more. And again, I don't, my purpose isn't to hold cards correctly. It's to hold cards the way I have held cards since I was a little girl, but still be able to do magical things. So any amount of cards, you could start with a whole bunch, you could start with half the deck, doesn't matter. And then you take the top goes to the bottom and the bottom goes to the top. So if I just took cards off of the top, I think it's best visually to go bottom to top first, but it doesn't matter. Literally just throw cards bottom, top, bottom, top. As messy as you, as you want it and they're gonna still be. And please know that I cannot see the screen right now, so I'm hoping that let me know if something doesn't show up. So that is my all time favorite fall shuffle because it is ugly and messy and it looks horrible and yet it's exactly what I want. So why complicate things for me? And this isn't me saying that y'all go and learn the shuffle. If cards is what you do, you don't want to do this shuffle. But the whole purpose behind me sharing this is when you think about what you're doing, and think about why you're doing it. I think so often we as magicians, like we want to do the next best thing for our group. And we want to do something cool and something new and more fancy and more, 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 more. And sometimes that just becomes clutter. And so going back to that simplicity and thinking, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to look kind of like a hot mess while doing cool things. So I don't want to sit there and look super, super fancy. The other thing I wanted to show y'all is um, my friend and Derek, we've talked about him some before. My friend Kevin Raylick has, in my opinion, the all time best way to Pharaoh. I worked and worked and worked on trying to perfect Pharaoh. And the way that I mostly do cards because I so appreciate the work that goes into doing slights right. I don't have the hours and hours and hours of time to put into making a card move look the way it should look because that's not what I do. But I so very much appreciate and love learning the mechanics behind why things work and how things work. And so usually if there's something, I want to work on it enough that I know like, okay, I understand how this works. From here, I just need hours and hours of practice. But I'm working on a new project. There is a new stack coming out that I'm really excited about because I'm working on the um, companion piece for the memory part of it. But that stack requires pharaohs. And to get from new deck order into Mnemonica, you need like seven out pharaohs. And so it was always something that I had really wanted to learn, but never had the time to just really, I was always told it's just one of those things you have to put time into. And then Kevin sat down with me on Zoom and in under five minutes taught me how to Pharaoh basically perfectly. Like after that, I took a few days of working on it, but it was the quickest, most amazing Pharaoh method I've ever seen. And so I asked him if I could start teaching it in my lecture and he keeps promising me that he's going to record it and release it as a download one day. So reach out to Kevin and keep an eye because he keeps saying that he's going to have a download that I can say, okay, go get this download for more details. But if you have cards on you and you don't have a fairing method, I suggest picking them up. And even if you do, I'll show you the way that Kevin does it because as someone that does not regularly handle cards, I learned how to Pharaoh using this method in less than a day. And that is incredible to me. So you break your cards in half. And when you're first starting, it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly in half because what you're really wanting to do is get the feel of like the pop of the cards going in together. Um, 
And you'll find within, with time, breaking those cards evenly in half is fairly easy. Especially if you're in a stack and you know what your, your 26 and 27 card is, you're, you're good. Um, so you hold them essentially the same way. Pinky on the bottom, two fingers, and thumb. One pack underneath, one pack on top. Your bottom pack, you're holding flat using your pinky. So it's straight. This pack, your pinky is towards the corner that's closest to your body. And then you're allowing it to bevel just slightly with your pinky and with your thumb. And then, you, I'm gonna try to do it without my pinky in the way at first. You get your card started on the first, so you're holding them together. You're using this finger to keep these cards taut. And then you just slide your cards in. And as you pull them towards you, they slide right into place. And this deck, I'm realizing, is I've been like used and used and used. It literally has wet cards like in, in it. But when you line those up and they start flowing in, can y'all see with my, see, no, I told you. No, when you turn like that, you went out of the camera shot. Okay. Back up a little bit, Sarah. I'm trying to get it so that y'all can actually see the detail of the cards. <clears throat> we all know what a feral looks like. Well, that's why I said I feel silly teaching this group this because all of y'all are so much better at cards than I am than it seems. But I do like always mentioning it because I am always the number of people that are looking for a way to pharaoh. So you're just laying it on your pinky. You're, and then you're just letting them slide into place Bullshit. as you slightly pull towards you. Bullshit. Awesome. So that is, we went through all of that stuff. I just have the chessboard left to show you guys. Um, but we can stop first if there's any memory questions. If there's anything y'all wanted to know specifically about, um, or any, just any other in general questions, I'm happy, happy to answer them. Although I think a lot of y'all, we got questions out kind of at the beginning too, which was helpful. I've got a Yeah, question. Jerry, is that a raised hand? Right, two things. Memorizing music is kind of hard for me, like a, a piece of music. Uh, do you suggest I, break it down into measures and stuff like that and use the memory path for that. Absolutely. And I've played with turning chords into snowmen. And so if you're getting into like music theory, you can have different chords have different personalities. And so you can have a family of snowmen in each of your chords. You have your major, your minor, and, and you know your devil's triad and so then you can give all of those chords characters and so then literally you're just placing your characters in order and again that's something that i've only just played with a little bit um an interesting thing is music and location are buried deepest within the hippocampus it's the last thing to go with patients with dementia usually and so when you look back at all of these ancient memory techniques, so often what we think of as ritual that is like mystic or having some kind of spiritual or religious connotation, it's actually telling stories that contain mnemonic information that's vital information for living where they are at that time. So all these nomadic cultures, they would travel the land and every time they would go, you know, usually they would travel the same path every year. And every time they would get to a new place on their path, they would sing a new song or the same song every time at the same place. 
but they would sing that song. They would do that ritual. They would do the dance. They would tell the story. And only the learned men, the knowledge holders, the elders of the tribe or the people group, they would know the translation of the stories and what those things meant. But to everyone else, it was this ritual that they participated in and this story that they told. And that's how information was shared for centuries and millennia from through these cultures. And uh, when um, like the Trail of Tears, when everyone was, when Native Americans were moved from their land, it wasn't just removing from land, it was essentially burning their libraries because their land was that location. And that each location that they would travel to would hold a different story with different images and different songs that they would then tell and share that then would tell them what they needed to know about the space they were in. Um, so it's interesting to me thinking about learning music and memorizing music and that there is something different in hearing a song and then actually like sitting down and playing an instrument. It's kind of the difference to me of seeing a picture and reading a word. And so it is, you have to think about how to think. The reason this, we created the musical staff, the Gregorian monks, when they put music on paper, was to make it mnemonic. They wanted to make a way to share that information visually and in a picture. But at the same time, in doing that, we've kind of stepped away from mnemonics because we've made more translations that have to happen. And so when you're thinking about memorizing music, you're thinking about notes on the page and, the, and all of the stuff that goes behind it. And so it's an interesting, an interesting thing. The fact that language was developed because of mnemonics, but because of, or written language, but because of written language, we've fallen away from using mnemonics is an ironic pattern um and now with technology it's just even worse because if we can put our brain in our phone why do we need our brain in our head so were the were the alphabets that were created like uh like i look at some of the hebrew or uh Arabic hebrew hebrew is an awesome example hand fire, signs like little fires they were looking at campfires and these little little flames would come up or something and somehow their alphabet looks like little fires or something. You know? Hebrew, the Hebrew alphabet can all be replicated in hand signs. So before it was written, it was sign language. And so it's a written representation of sign language. I see. Ancient, ancient Chinese was pictographs, hieroglyphics, pictures. All writing started as images and so my friend who is Chinese and teaches Chinese thinks, says that he talks about like older Chinese is like calligraphy Chinese and that today's Chinese is just Chinese. But the calligraphy Chinese has the pictures. So the word for sun looks like a sun. The word for boat looks like a boat. And in most languages that have, you know, that are some of the first written languages, they all fall back to some type of mnemonic. And talking about um, the scale and notes, those were all first done as, it, as a mnemonic on the hand. Um, and it's written about in a lot of the older memory books, but also something I learned about in school. Right. And That's a, yeah. I, did you, was there a second question? I know I went off on a tangent that has nothing I to like do with that. it. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I usually think of miners as uh, miners in a mine, mining for things. Ah! You know? And uh, and I think of majors as majorettes, you know, that are in a, you know, like a, a white outfit leading the band or something like that. So uh, uh, one is more dark and foreboding yes. and the other one is more bright and sunny, you know. Uh, but uh, the other thing I'm having a little trouble with is remembering names. That's very difficult somehow, you know. Uh, and do you have any ideas for that? So for me, the difficulty with names isn't necessarily remembering the name. It's remembering the face. And I definitely have a hard time with facial recognition. Like, so that is something that I am still really working to 
overcome. With that being said, there are lots of methods that are great methods that work and it's, I think, figuring out what you prefer. So the biggest thing is when you meet someone, taking time to remember their name. And that's the one thing that mnemonics can't fix. Other than if you are trying to remember a name and you're forcing yourself to use your mnemonics, then you're forcing yourself really to take time to think about that person's name. Associate, think about the, how many name, associate the name to a prominent feature on their face or head. Yes. And then so you know that's what, hold on, that's what I was, I was going to get to. So you first have to get into the habit of paying attention when someone tells your name, tells you their name to say, oh, I'm wanting to remember this. And then you want to pay attention to what is the first thing you notice about that person. And ideally you want this to be something that is going to stay with that person for a long time. I mean, unless you're just trying to learn about remembering someone's name for a show and then you don't care when they walk out the door what their name is, you don't want to associate it with like their crazy hat because you don't know that you're going to see them the next time. But if you're just wanting to remember a name for a show, go with their clothing, go with what they're wearing, go with, you know, whatever stands out to you in that moment about them the most because you know that they're not going to go change their clothes in the middle of your performance. But if you want to learn someone's name long term, go with something that is not going to change, most likely. And it's whatever your mind gravitates towards first, whatever's prominent about them to you that you're going to remember, oh yeah, they had that nose that was kind of funny or, and then you take their name and it's going down to that, that first fundamental of images and find a way to represent their name in a picture. Now that may be that you take a celebrity that you know, and that was something Robert and I were talking about earlier. Take a celebrity you know and imagine that person doing something with whatever that prominent feature is. And so, or it may be taking someone that you know that's personal and close to you that you have a strong connection with and then imagining them with that person. And again, when you're imagining those things, you want to invoke emotion. So you want to do something weird, sexual, gross, funny, something along those lines. So if you're connecting a person you already know with the same name to another person, let them have fun in whatever crazy way you see that happening. Uh, you don't have to go with people you know, though, because sometimes you'll get names that you don't know anyone with that name. And from there, you just find whatever your mind immediately pops up as a picture to associate with their name. And sometimes you'll find, like I was talking about the Star of David for is what I use for David's. But sometimes, so sometimes it'll be something that connects in that way. Or for Catherine's, you might always use a cat. But to tell your cats and Catherine's apart, you could make cats have a short cat on them. And Catherine has a long cat with a long, like abnormally long cat is wrapped around, let's say if they have a long neck, you could have it wrapped around their neck. Or if Catherine has a really big nose, you could have this incredibly long cat hanging off of their long nose. And that's gonna remind you, Catherine. The other option is to use the letter alphabet that we had talked about which is you throw everybody with the same name on the same letter and then you have this action happening there and you can collect locationally different names on those letters. So like on your letter A, you could have a spot for Allison's and a spot and you're just kind of alphabetically ordering everyone's name and then you picture those people there. But again, the problem kind of with that for me is that you don't have anything associating those people that it's that finding something about their physical attribute that stands out to you and sets them apart and makes them unique from all other people. So you can recognize them out of a group of people. Um, so there's all different ways you can translate the name. It's finding the right way that works for your brain to stick that name to a person. And for me, if it's a show, I'm gonna go, because I'm not good with faces, 
I'm going to go with what they're wearing almost every time, unless there's just something about that person that really, really jumps out at me. Um, so th those are your, your variations for names. Right. And those names that you used on the uh, 25 queen, uh, kings and queens in your book or something like that, do you use those pictures like when you get a uh, Elizabeth, you think of a lizard or something every time and, and, and yes, uh, yes, we talk about names in the memory arts. Um, we teach the monarchs and go through. And so like you have, um, Will, William, the, is a, is, 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 is your willow tree. You have willow, willow tree, tree for William. Right. Richard is a pile of coins, like a riches and stuff like yeah. that. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's exactly doing that. Um, but then finding a way, so if you met a Richard, you could imagine that Richard being buried in a pile of coins. Mm -hmm. And what about that person would stand out to you? So what I found with names is that having multiple systems that are, that work for everything else, um, really having multiple systems, I'm sorry, I'm reading chats as they come to me. I'm trying to talk at the same time, which multitasking that way is something I am not good at. Uh, having multiple systems for memorizing names and then using the ones that work best for you in that moment so far is what I recommend because I've not found a one single system that is like, this is going to work for everything. But it's the same way with memorizing cards. If you want to memorize a stack, go this route. If you want to start memorizing, like speed memorizing cards and you want to be, you know, like these guys that compete on the memory sports um, that are memorizing stacks in 15 seconds and under, then you're going to want to go with like a PAO, um, a, a, a system that's adding a lot more. It takes a lot more pre-memory work to get to the point where you can do. What did you say? That Use a what? A PAO. So it's a person action object okay. system. Okay. And so instead of like in the memory arts, we have your characters, your 13 characters. Every single card you give a, an individual person. So every two of hearts is a person. Same person. They get an action and they get PAO, object. I know someone that added um, adjective to that. And I'm doing a one-on-one -on -one, um, consulting with a guy who is wanting to break them into groups of five. So he's doing person, action, object, adjective, animal. And so every single card gets assigned a person, an action, object, animal, an action or adjective. And all of those go together to make, so each card becomes this character of its own. And so then when you go to memorize cards, instead of memorizing one card at a time, you're memorizing, if you're doing person, action, object, you're memorizing three cards at a time. Because your first card is going to be your person. The second card is going to be represented by the action that that person is doing. The third card is going to be represented by the object that that person is doing the action to. So you're looking at three cards and immediately making that connection of them all being together. But now they're all stored on one location. So that's why um, this guy that I'm working with is going with five. Okay, so, so, that at so you're saying that you're, if you're learning three cards in a row, you want, the first one would be a person, the second one would be an action, and the third one would be an object, and the next one would be an adjective, and the other one would be an animal or something. If you're yep, yep, if you're doing five in a chunk. Yeah. And, and so, so all five of those cards would go at your tower. So you'd look at those five cards at one time, you immediately know what, with practice, you immediately know like you see that picture with those five cards. Do you have like a star on that tower or something where you have points of the star that are a, a different location for each one of those five? No, because they're all doing it. It's happening at one time. So you're now thinking of five cards as one thing. 
So you have a person. So I'm, I, when we were originally set ours, I'm two of hearts. And so two of hearts. Uh, the action for clubs was always like bashing and three of clubs. And I have not used this system in a while. So I'm trying to go back and remember. So for example, it would be if it's ace of hearts, it would be me. And then if the next was three of clubs, it would be a cowboy hat. And then, oh no, that would be the op option, uh, object. It would then be your, um, doing a haymaker, two. And then if your third card was say, ace of spades, um, or let's say ace of diamonds to a face of a diamond, like a diamond face. So you would see those three cards together and you go, oh, Sarah is doing a haymaker to this diamond face all at once. And those are your three cards. And so that's why you don't, they don't have different locations because it's happening all together. So Sarah, are you saying that you would take a single card and give it those three attributes? Yes. And therefore the first card would have the first attribute. The second card would have the second attribute of that card and the third. yes that's a lot of memorization yes there's a lot of pre-memory and that was why when my daughter wanted to go along and memorize with us and she's four i'm like there is no way that she is going to memorize 156 different things associated with a card and then what you can do is you can give it so that each suit has kind of a feeling behind it and then each value has some other attribute. And so you find a person that fits both of those attributes in your chart. And then you give that person an object that makes sense to go with them and an action that makes sense to go with them and uh, uh, um, object, action, adjective that makes sense to go with them and then an animal that makes sense to go with them. But you have to do all of that prep before you can even start memorizing. Now, once you go to actually memorize the cards, it's incredibly, I mean, you can memorize. With our system, we got it down when we were really working to try to see like, how quickly can you do the memory arts for speed? Because a lot of people were one, I mean, when we originally started with the memory arts, we weren't trying to memorize a stack. We were just trying to memorize a randomly shuffled deck of cards. And so we did want to know how quick can you memorize just a new deck of cards. And we got it down to under a minute, but it took work. And with a PAO system, you're doing way more work at the beginning. And then, but that ultimate memorizing your stack is happening at a fifth of the speed. Because, and then, and when you talk about people that are competing, they actually go and do all that, like all of the combinations for all of these things. And then they have those actions ready. So I was talking about, you know, you want, if you're doing the list game to have a set action for every location, they have their group of three cards and every single combination of group of three cards, they know those already. So they're not having to translate. So there is so much pre-memory. So that's why when before with other systems, before the memory arts came out, people would use mnemonics to memorize a stack and be like, this takes forever. And it is a lot of work. And even then you don't have the stack location numbers with the stack. And so that's what the memory arts did different was giving that stack. I mean, cause that's what you need. If you are doing a stack, you need that location and that card to go together and be the same. You need to see them as one thing always together. And it's fun when you do the double stack and you start having your cards that are connected across the two stacks because it really does open up the possibilities for, for ways to perform that, that haven't really been thought of that much before. Um, but Jerry, I think you can attest like because you went through that that doing the two of them together like it, it yeah it you're makes learning it... 156 things right off the bat then aren't you 
you got two cards for every location and you've learned 52 locations, right? Mm -hmm. um, but with the card characters, we tried to go with things that were naturally, that just naturally went together. Um, and I'll be honest, I'm not the, so, and part of creating a book with someone else is you have to find those compromises. And in creating a book about mnemonics, that's really great because there's so many people that write about memory in systems and they say, this is the way to memorize a stack, or this is the way to memorize cards. This is the way to memorize names. This is the way to do that. That's not, that's not true. There are multiple ways to memorize cards. And depending on what you want to do with those cards, you pick the system that works best for you and for your purpose. Let me ask you a question. Are you, are you dividing the, the tower into four quadrants with this uh, five system or are you doing it with the three? I mean, no. No, no. So for what he's doing for this consulting I'm doing, he is going with the basic PAO in that every single, no, sorry. He actually, what we what we figured out was that each, so there's 13 card values. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm trying to think through because we've gone back and forth and I'm trying to figure out where he landed. And so we'll meet and then he'll work and he'll put his, his characters together and then we'll meet and go, okay, where's the next step from this? And we were playing with the idea of having 13 cards for the values and then having it so that your suits are represented by something associated with that person. So like diamonds could be riches and, and wealth and, and shininess. And then hearts or everything is in love. And whatever that action is, even if it's an ugly action, it is now somehow done in love. But um, that got complicated when you're trying to throw five cards together to tell the suits apart. So really when you're chunking them like that, you want to have 52 separate, separate characters. Um, weren't, weren't the suits originally the four elements like uh, fire, water, air, you know, earth, fire, water, and air or something like that? Yeah, and then you, well, you have, um, I mean, they still aren't necessarily the, the suits that we know them by in other countries. Um, and so, yeah, giving them some kind of attribute like that, it's a, I'm now, the reason I'm not answering quickly is because I'm thinking, because I'm thinking about the idea of how would you combine a PAO with the locations for your suits so that you have 13. And so then you have, the person would be doing, the person would be in their quadrant but they would be doing the action in potentially another quadrant, which I guess could work with like stretching arms, but to an object that potentially is in another quadrant. I just think it gets really cluttered. I think you really do have to have, if you're going for speed, you have to just do the upfront pre-memory work. I mean, but again, you can do this in under a minute if, if you put in the practice. Well, yeah, a five kind of makes sense if you think of a person's body on top of the tower, then you've got a thing for your head and one for each hand and one for each foot, you know, and you could lay your uh, animal or your action on each one of those five locations or something on the tower picture. So your person would become essentially a location on the location and then that person would have they would be doing an action with one hand, holding an object in the other hand. The animal would be by their one foot Possibly. and an Possibly. adjective would be happening to the other foot. Maybe. That's yeah. fun. I don't see why that wouldn't work. I like that a lot. See, that's why, I mean, there's so many different, it's unlimited. The only thing that limits it is your imagination and yeah, and you, can, you can also associate it with the five senses too, because there's five 
things coming out of your body. You know, you got two arms, two legs, and you know, and, and one head. So you got basic, you know, more more or less. And <laughs> using the body as a mnemonic device, I actually have my skeleton back here because one of the things that is a project that I've been saying I'm gonna finish forever and have just been too busy is drawing all of the bones on the body but using the body as a path so like the femur is a female lemur running down your leg um patella is this i always think of him as paw it's this guy with a straw coming out of his mouth and a straw hat and, and paw is telling a story and that's on your kneecap and um so using the body as an actual path and locations and then memorize like picturing things on your body is an excellent way to memorize things and then talking about like using a body drawn to think about like the five points on the body is something that they used to do a lot in um like religious texts they would draw out these crazy images that it's it's funny because it's gone in most religions they've gone back and forth between using and loving mnemonics and then saying that mnemonics are evil and of the devil and so much of even magic has roots in these mnemonic principles and things that we think of as like magic incantations are really memory path and information actually just the hand the the bones in the hand are 27 things so you have two hands, you could have two decks of cards. I mean, half you of could it. put them, literally have them on your hand on or your have hand. them. You could imagine your stack on your body, but you would want to have a way to break up those locations numerically in a way that you know, oh, this is 13 or this is right, right. whatever number. So um, and I have been, one of the things I have been working on is actually I'm calling it um, neur neurotica. <laughs> so it's a combination of erotica and mnemonica. And it is turning car all the card values into different parts of the body and then the stack location into different parts of the body. And so the female represents the card and the male, re male represents the card, female represents the location. And then the way they, those, their body parts come together tell you what the card is and the interaction tells you the suit. So it is like a really fun thing to play with. Yeah. And that helps you with your going from location to card instead of card to location. Um, because you have a card. So when you've got the memory arts down, Going from locate, like picturing, so there's memorizing and then there's recalling, right? Like you have to be able to bring the information back. And so recalling your stack from locations is really easy because you have those numbers, you picture the number in your head and then you think what location fills in that number as a picture. And then from there, the story that's happening there just follows. But one thing that takes practice is going from card to stack. Because if you're calling out, uh, let's go with Ace of Jack. Hearts. Of, Ace of Hearts. Yeah, well, I was gonna say Jack of Spades because it was the one y'all. I was trying to think of one that's on these ten that y'all have learned. Right, although right, I just right, jumped right, with the first. Right, right. So yeah. So let's say um, you're gonna go with uh, five of clubs. You're going to immediately you're, you go to your club quadrant, <laughs> and then you picture the bees. Yeah. And you go, what's happening there? And then, Jerry, I see you know what's happening there. And you know, you picture, okay, large beehive, where is that? Oh, that's on top of the mountains, three. That step takes a little more practice. But when I say a little more practice, I'm not comparatively to some of the methods in um, when I read Mnemonica and his methods for memorizing Mnemonica, and I love Mnemonica. There was one thing that there was one thing that wasn't clear to me, uh, when, but it became clear tonight when you said that there were multiple things for Mnemonica and a single thing for Aronson, and I never realized that before you before tonight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's multiple small for Mnemonica, and Aronson is one large for Aronson, right? Mm -hmm.
And so that's how you tell those two apart. Well, that, I, that's it for my questions. <laughs> <laughs> You want to do the David, uh, did I hear you? Did I see you wave a hand or I no? Okay. I'll wave back anyway. <laughs> you want to do the chessboard? Oh yeah. Yeah. If we're done with questions, I can do the chessboard. Yeah. So like so much else, this is a work in progress. And just talking about the journey, it's something I'm excited to be able to share with y'all and just be able to try it in as many different ways as possible because I'm also really excited about it. Um, so first off, can I see a show of hands if you're familiar with the Knights Tour? Okay, so the, I see some people that aren't familiar, which is fine. The Knights Tour his Wait, one quick second. Is anybody else hearing a crackling sound? I'm not. There's a really annoying, like, uh, buzzing sound. It's almost like a feedback type of thing. Oh, hold on. I'm going to try this. You're the only other mic open. Okay. Yeah, and I'll leave because I don't need my second one open. But I didn't have my... my I had audio turned off on my phone, so it shouldn't. Did that do anything? Let me try muting you for a second. Yeah, muting you stopped the uh, the buzzing. We can't hear you. You're muted, Sarah. Is that, so that, the sound is probably worse, but did the buzzing stop? Yes. Okay. Did it for me. I unplugged my mic. I'm going to try to plug my mic back in one more time, but if not, I mean, are y'all, would y'all prefer this over the buzzing? Because the parent, okay. I can hear you just fine now. Okay. All right. Great. Something's wrong with my mic, I guess. Okay. The Knights Tour is based on the idea that you can traverse a chessboard with a knight, the playing piece, by only touching every piece one time, and you can cover the entire board. Now, traditionally, this has been performed with numbers. Every piece is numbered, and then if you're doing it by memory, you have memorized the cyclical pattern of numbers. There are, of course, ways to do it without memory. You have a crib. Um, there are some great methods that like, as you are removing the numbers from the board, it's telling you the next number. So there are ways to cheat, but memorizing the string of numbers really isn't difficult. So I've performed the Knights Tour with the numbers many times. But one of the things I hated was that the Knights tour is supposed to be about chess and then you number it and it's not even numbered the way people would number i have my it down so that i can do this in a second so that you can see my chess board i know i'm out of the screen um so wanting to remove the numbers because again thinking about purpose numbers have nothing to do with the chessboard, and suddenly this night's chess routine becomes a math routine and, oh, well, I'm doing these complicated mathematical equations in my head and now I'm gonna tell you where to go. And so I was trying to play with how do I memorize this path without numbers, just as locations and completely remove the numbers. And somewhere along the way, during that journey, I discovered that you don't have to memorize the numbers. You don't have to memorize anything and it is absolutely incredible. So I'm still playing with the presentation of this idea, but I have you do that right.
my pile of blocks over here. So I'm also going to grab a sticker, or two stickers. Someone, um, someone who is unmuted, say stop when I am on a block that moves you. Stop. Stop. Okay. So I'm going to put a Millennium Falcon sticker on this piece. And then I'm going to take another piece and another smaller Millennium Falcon and put on the top. And that's the fun thing that I am still figuring out is which is the top and bottom of these pieces. So talking about the journey again, and this is in part, this is just me sharing with you guys what I'm doing. This is not what I would be putting in the pattern. Um, as I was creating this chessboard, I was reading um, Kaufman's book on the land. And I came across the checkerboard puzzle where they broke up the checkerboard into all of these pieces. And so, I realized that would be a really fun thing to combine with the checkboard. So not only do you have your checkerboard puzzle happening, you have your chess piece puzzle happening as well. So ideally in a world with multiple people in it, they can actually touch and handle the things you're working on. There we go. I would have a group of people up on stage as I'm introducing the Knights who are building my chessboard for me, demonstrating how very difficult this is. Because the original checkerboard puzzle was actually made with um, one-sided pieces. But this is now 3D, so you don't even know what your top and bottom is, which adds that extra layer of, of difficulty. So, and then the other thing that I worked on developing is a way that you can now put these pieces together so that it makes sense to you without having, so it seems, it is this, you know, seemingly random order, but it is incredibly easy and quick to build. But that is the part I'm still working on. So I did this the other day and realized, for example, this piece, it's the same either way. And so you have to pay attention to those types of things. But then I built in all of these little extra memory devices to help with that. And I am. Oh, no, there it is. I was like, I'm missing a piece. So the nice tour actually was first developed for a Sanskrit poem. And the poem, and this is completely true, the poem is a mnemonic device that goes through the two work. Wait, something's not right. You've got two white pieces together. Oh yeah, you're right. I put this one, I put There we go. Now we should be good to go. And the way we're looking at it, that's not a chessboard. How is it not a chessboard? Because the white goes to the bottom right. And you've got uh, black. So you've got saying black I built on the it bottom. upside down that it really should be. No, no, you want to turn it 90 degrees. 90 degrees. 90 degrees is all. And then that's good. And then that's a chessboard. But see, thank you. These are the types of things. What this is, is two maps built on top of each other. 
And I discovered something when I actually built it that I had rotated the map, which allows you to build it in multiple ways. Um, but when I was playing with the fastest way to build it, it's fastest to build from here up. But if I'm going to, if you're going to have astute chess players that are saying this, you know, having it built this way is not, is not building a chess board. Well, well, it's just the way that I'm looking at it. If, if you were sitting there getting ready to play chess, that's like a that. chess board. Yeah. That's a chess board right there. And part of it is like, I had not designed it. Like this is just a podium that I had. And I was like, oh, this is really convenient to be able to show this on Zoom. So really it's built to go in a black, almost shallow box that it sits down with little feet. And then it also, each piece has a neodymium magnet that comes with it. So if you want to attach the magnet to the back and have it so it's one-sided instead of double-sided, you can build it up on a wall. Um, but again, playing with the quickest way, because I've been playing with this for six, seven months now, is to build this side up. But if you're building on a flat surface, you could build from the side over and it wouldn't be a big deal. Um, but thank you for, for pointing that out for me. Because that's why I share these things. That's what, like, when I talk about, like, these, like, you have to have these moments of criticism. Because I am not, you know, I wouldn't look at that and go, oh, that's not a chessboard. To me, a chessboard is a chessboard no matter which angle it's at. But that's, but to know that some people are going to look and think, oh, that's not right, is such a great thing. So I'm going to have to now take that into account, which is why this is not released yet. Not even if you play it that way, then the kings and the queens are on the wrong spots when yeah, the game they're starts. Be. Well, but it is as far as it's just twisted in y'all's view, right? Because I don't want to take this whole thing and twist it because I feel like it might fall apart. Well, maybe here. There. Is that, is that right or do I need to keep going? <laughs> That's a chessboard. There you go. Okay. So, I'm very excited about this night. This is L. This is also part of what I realized. I was first trying to use, make a night piece into a stamp and couldn't find a stamp that showed up well on this board. And someone suggested chalk and I have this awesome artist chalk. And so develop this nice little knight and the chalk just twists right in. And this is how you now can perform the tour. And my story that goes along with it, I was originally just developing this for myself, for my character. Oh, I'm starting here. And you know that a knight moves in the shape of an L, which is the reason I've named my knight L. So that means two up, one over, or one over, two up, or two down, one over. That's the only way she can move. So you can watch, hopefully, can you see the, let me see as I'm crossing them off. So just watch and make sure that I am following that L pattern. But I was fascinated to find out that the Knights Tour had been around for so long and that it had been developed in um, Sanskrit originally. And then that it was originally mnemonic was this kind of crazy realization to me. And so then in doing more research, found that it's actually used in modern day for a lot of people doing computer programming. They do these computer programs in a basic computer programming course, and they say, you need to be able to program the computer to perform the night tour. So that is a way. What happened? 
what happened? I'm sorry, Sarah, what are you doing? I, well, I thought I was gonna start over. So we are covering, we started on the piece selected on the top and my knight is moving over every piece in the shape, in the move that the knight can make, only touching every piece a single time. And if I put no, the you, you just touched that piece. You just touched the same piece twice. Which piece did I touch twice? The, uh, yes, that one. That one wasn't. That one wasn't. Is it here? You move y'all closer. But I find it very interesting that you can do it while you keep a conversation going. As long as I've built it correctly. I taught my mom how to do this, and it took her longer to explain to her. Okay, so we're starting here. It took longer to explain to her how a knight properly moves than how to perform the tour with this board. And that was seriously like two minutes, and she was she had it and was able to do it. She had to pause and think every now and then, but really I think she was pausing and thinking to go, wait, how is my move allowed to be moved? More than anything. Okay, that got us on a different track. So now we're over here. Now we're gonna go down here. And we'll go up here and then over here. Wait, you can hit that piece twice. And now you can. So you can, of course, like build this up as much as you want and go as slowly and feign the stress as much as you want and, oh, I don't know which way to go. Another great idea that I had given to me the other night is to actually have a chessboard up on the screen and have it that the night nice tour is written out with numbers. And so you have your audience race you but they're just going through numbers and you're doing it just by figuring it out. Or as I say, it was like the magic of Elle who is sniffing her way around the board to find the hidden treat that we hid for her at the beginning. So my pattern that goes with this character, or what goes with this board is very strange and weird and is not anything that anyone else would want to yeah. perform it as. Yeah, no kidding. Um, well, that, and this is not my pattern. This is just me talking about the board. But I have had some really great pattern ideas about talking about life and decisions and following decisions. And there's so many things you could work into. There's times that you get stuck over in one part of the board and there's times that suddenly you travel quickly across the board. And you can work all of that into your pattern and talk about the journey of life and trying to reach your final destination. And that all of a sudden things start coming together. Okay, so I want y'all to see this is the piece we ended on, right? This is the part that I have to figure out if I... Ah! I put the sticker on the bottom instead of putting the sticker on the top. Sign this up. But, so, covered the whole board. You started with a randomly selected spot and end on a randomly selected spot. Had I stuck it to the correct randomly selected spot. Huh. And so that is the idea. How did you do that? How did you do that? <laughs> Does anybody realize how difficult it is? I used to play this on graph paper when I was in high school. And the object of the game was to fill up the entire, the eight by eight square of, of uh, paper, okay? And I can't tell you how many times I did not complete that. It's incredible. That was very nice. Thank you. 
Um, that is one thing that I'm trying to kind of work through is that people don't realize necessarily how awesome this is. <laughs> I've had, I had a friend I showed it to and she goes, oh, I could do that. And I was like, all right, let me see. Yeah. And so that's where um, starting thinking about, you know, there's been nice tours where you have, you're, if you're using numbers, you're having the person either mark off the number or whatever. And so the fun speed aspect is that you're calling off numbers faster sometimes than they can even find them on the board, which is what got me thinking. And this is literally just thinking like a few nights ago. Because like I said, this is just bringing y'all into the middle of the journey of what has been six or seven months now of, of developing this. And the idea of having, if you're gonna do it on Zoom, putting a chessboard on the screen and then having your entire audience trying to follow along on the chessboard on the screen and giving them some kind of exam, like, so that they do realize that this is, it is something I feel like that if you're not familiar with chess, it can be lost on you how I was how just going to say, challenging. if you don't play chess, you're not going to be impressed with this. But, you're going to go, yeah, okay. Hey, well, again, this was not a good presentation. This was just a, this is the project that I'm working on. I have seen the Knights Tour done in ways that blow people away. Yeah, yeah I have too. And I think that with, like, with the right presentation, but that right presentation has to be right for each person. Because my right presentation is only right within my show, within my character, within my story. If I was to suddenly start going into the pattern that I use talking about L my night and the games and stories we played together in the hospital as I developed a board out of old kid blocks, it's different than no one else is again gonna do it that way. But if you're talking about being a chess master or you know, all of these different ways there are the right ways to present it that make any type of audience go, damn, that's awesome. And part of it is figuring out what those elements are of the performance and what those pieces are that you want to be the same, no matter what storyline you're telling, what helps your lay audience or your non-chess playing audience realize that this is, this is. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, are you using just one particular layout and then just adjusting for where you start and that it's, it's a cyclical thing. So you can, you can go, you can start at any square and actually come back to some point near that starting point, wherever right. it might be, but you have to be able to adjust so that you'll end up on any square on the board, right? At the yeah. end, right? So if you're doing it, if you're doing it with the numbers or doing it by memory, that's absolutely what you're doing. You have a cyclical series of 64 numbers and, and you just know those, that series of numbers. And if you're starting on number 13, then you're going to start on number 13 and you're going to go through and you're going to end on number 12. How, how many different night tours are you aware of? Um, so there's been a lot of variation of the night tour as far as being performed. But that question is one that I don't know as an answer. Because again, the first night tour literally was written in a Sanskrit poem. And so what has been done with that since then? Now within magic, there's quite a few, but again, they all go back to numbers. And I have, and if you find one that doesn't, please let me know because I have talked to everyone and put out all of my feelers and have had so many different variations of the night tour sent to me and watched so many different variations of the night tour. And if, um, if you've got the number system memorized for the night's tour, then there's 64 different ways to do it. Because there's 64 squares. There's 64 so squares you could have somebody same. put a knight down anywhere. And as long as you've got it memorized, then you can yeah. start from whatever square and you can cover the board. I've only yeah. seen. I've well, only but seen. you, the, what? Yes. So you don't, what 
I tried to add to it is getting a starting spot labeled and an ending spot labeled, but labeling them when the board is still separate and the that was fantastic. That was amazing that you that you did that. So that is, and again, put within good patter that isn't broken up with me trying to explain the process of how I got here. That point will build and then you have that oh look I've covered the entire board and then you have that moment of showing oh but we stopped on this spot remember that sticker you lift it and you reveal it and again I wouldn't use I just grab my um, Star Wars stickers because that's what I had nearby for Elle um, she's gonna have either a tuft of grass and thinking like a tuft of grass with rainbows coming out of it because she's searching for the rainbow but I've talked about like even having it be a tombstone if you're talking about life and when you lift it up at underneath it, it that you've landed on the tombstone. So I mean, I think there's, and then, or you could just go completely chest and mark the bottom with an X and mark the top with an X and that's, that's it. You don't have to throw some crazy storyline. So what I'm getting at, you, the 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 grid or the pattern you're using is the same one every time. I'm only aware of three patterns that form the night tour. There's more than three, and then if you allow yourself to go off the board, there's more. But I don't go off the board. I mean, that's not right, right, the right, 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 right. But sometimes when they have that as far as a computer programming challenge, they'll add that. Okay, now do it that you can jump off the board. How many options do you have? And, um, but yes, it is a cyclical pattern of, you know, 64, you're rotating through 64. And there are several different ways to do it. But what's so beautiful about this board is I'm making them in limited quantities. And I'm only making um, four at a time. And each one is custom. So each person's path I have with a single path I can put it on a board four different ways and then there are like you said multiple path options so no board is the same wow my board and my movements aren't going to be what anyone else's is and when I was making my pieces um I was using this polyurethane stain that I thought was going to be really great and it soaked in way more than I wanted. And so I was just trying to, as far as like a really nicely made professional looking board, I was disappointed. But for my purposes of wanting to be this, you know, patient that put together this board out of kids blocks, having these dirty, messy, just pieces like this is exactly what I want. Um, and so I have, I'm making four more, I'm considering them like prototype boards, trying four different finishes. And depending on how those go, I'll either have options for finishes. So you can do like the natural finish or like the high gloss finish. Um, and, but I'm still playing with finding a finish that really is a high grade, like nice, done woodwork instead of you know the, the finish is soaked in and doesn't have quite as, as nice a look to it and so they'll all like I'll be able to stain it if you want it whatever color you know because every single one will be custom ordered and custom How much are they? so total including time of like one-on-one -on -one instruction and the fact that everybody's map is separate and has to be separately built for them. Um, it is 500, but you put $100 down to get on the waiting list. And then I take the first four people from the waiting list at a time. And once I get your customizations from you and I start those four boards, I have to have 50% down. So 250, start the board. It takes about two weeks to make a board. It still takes about two weeks to make four boards, just because of like the drawing time in between things. Uh, if you want it stained as opposed to just finished, then you're looking at a little more time. Um, so then once it's finished, the rest goes down and I ship it. 
And then it comes with it. Well, it will come with when I have it all finished. Cause like I said, I don't, I am not even at the point yet that I'm ready. I keep going. I have people that have like tentatively gone on my waiting list. They're like on my waiting list to hear when the waiting list opens <laughs> because I don't want to be at a point that I am selling something that I'm still trying to figure all these little pieces out of. Um, because this is something I am so proud of, but I never would have figured it out had I not been trying to figure out a fun way to perform the memorized night tour. And just totally, I asked somebody to say something to me and it just kind of clicked and I was like, huh, how would you do that? And then I started thinking and it, it just built one after another. Um, so it's just, I, it's exciting to be able to kind of share that journey with y'all. And if you have any ideas for like, man, this would be really, you know, a great element to add to well, it. Well, I, I only thought of one thing. There's a chess master uh, that teaches chess, right? And he's got a chess board that's sitting down. When he moves the pieces, it moves it on the screen. So he's uh -huh. got a screen up there. So if you're doing it with a screen, then you could you could do do it that way if you wanted to. Yes, and and having it so that it's you know the video displayed up in a larger area, or again, if you the large wanted, auditorium, right? Yeah, or even if you were doing like a close up show and you wanted people to be able to see the board better, you could build it. Every board will come with the magnets to attach to the back. Um, but that has to be something up to each individual performer because once you attach those magnets to the back, you no longer have a 3D checkerboard piece puzzle. It, you know which side is top and which side is bottom. So maybe that doesn't matter. And if that doesn't matter and you want to build it up on, on the wall so that people can see them, then add the magnets to it. Um, you don't. You, you, you don't so, have to. Okay, let me let me get this. Uh, so then the idea is that you select a piece at random and then you build the puzzle. So at the audience members, it's again, I've been developing this since COVID. So I've not gotten the chance to like actually work with this with a real live audience and human hands other than my daughter who knows how it works and is so done with me showing her things that she like her poor little head's exploding. So um, my ideal situation is that you have like four people up on the stage and you go into whatever introduction to the night's tour works for you. Talking about how the night piece works and all of this stuff, but you tell them, oh, you need to build my board for me. It's easy to throw it together while I'm explaining. So then you have a group of people who are playing with all of these puzzle pieces. And then at any point in time, you can say, hey, pause and um, pick any piece. Okay, cool. You got that piece, mark it with a sticker. And then you can grab a, piece, a random piece without looking, with looking, whatever, and stick a sticker on it. And then say, okay, go back to building, finish building the board. And then you talk and then whatever you, you know, however long you've decided you want to let them sit there and struggle and not be able to build this board, then you say, oh, okay, you guys, get out of the way, I'll build it. And then with practice, and once I have like the system of this is the way to build it quickly, and this is how you know which piece is which and whatnot, then you can build it very quickly. And then you immediately go into performing the tour. The idea being that they've marked the pieces and there's been this space of time between even marking the pieces and you building the board. And then you say, okay, now the, the sticker that ended up on the top, will start on that sticker or, or mark, whatever it is that you're using to designate your two pieces. We'll start on this one that we can see. And I like, performing it without revealing what you're trying to do, that you're trying to end on that piece, that other piece selected. So that really it is just, you are talking about like, 
filling up the board, the difficulty of the night's tour, what the night's tour is, and you can pause and talk about, oh, look, see here, I could, at this moment, I could go here, I could go here, I could go here, and I could go here. But only one of these directions is going to be able to get me to cover the board. So it's, I have to figure out out of these choices I have, which one I'm going to go. And those choices are going to have consequences. I'm going to go here. And so then you, you go through your tour, do it as quickly or as slow as you want. And there does need to be moments of build and release and build and release and tension and non-tension as fits within your character. And then you end up and you say, all right, I did it. I filled the entire board. I only touched every piece only one time. And let's check. We ended on this piece. Remember that we marked two pieces at the beginning and then you reveal that you've ended on the other randomly selected piece. I think it's like the other randomly selected square. I think I would use the word square. Yes, for, yes. Yeah. instead of piece, because the pieces designate the, yes, the, that the, is absolutely a, um, right. uh -huh. an important and, and that, detail. So how many, uh, how many pieces in your puzzle? <laughs> 14. 14 pieces make up a chessboard. So some of the, the so the smallest one has. The smallest has three. Oh three. wait, I twisted the board now. I'm like, wait, no, oh yeah. The smallest one has three, and then the largest one has what, six or five or what? One is. That's all I one, two, three, four, five, right. Five. Five is the largest. And there's quite a few with five. There are, there's just one with three and then there's quite a few with four mm -hmm. and uh, most of the shapes are duplicated uh, but they're never duplicated in color so so all the two and ones are all yeah I see what you mean Every single piece is different, even the pieces that are shaped the same. But these are your tricky pieces because they're, they're the only ones that are symmetric. All the other pieces have a clear direction that they either go this way or this way if you know what that is. But these, you can put that way or that way and it's the same. And I didn't realize that if anybody went to my other lecture, that was what had happened. I tried this again. I did the same thing. I finished with my lecture showing this. And every time it's different because every time I've learned a little more and changed or tweaked a little something. And the first time I did it in a lecture for anyone, I've been performing it for myself and like, you know, for MJ and a, a, bit, a few friends that I have kind of working with me on some of this and done it fine. And then I built it and I kept doing the tour. I was like, I have checked the board. It's all right. I don't understand. I built it correctly. I was like, hold on. And I found this piece and I flipped it. And then I did the tour again. And I was like, wait a second, there's another symmetric piece and it's this one. So these two, this is piece eight and three. Pieces eight and three. Ironically, I did not decide that these were pieces eight and three because of that fact, but it works out well that three doubled makes eight. So that's how I remember that three and eight are your two pieces that you have to make sure that you're really paying attention that they go in the correct wow. way, direction. Yeah. So do the individual quadrants or squares within each puzzle piece have numbers associated with each square itself or is it just the puzzle, just 14 puzzle pieces? You know what I'm saying? Like you it's have 14 puzzle pieces and I what mean, yeah. I'm trying to do is make it, I'm trying to figure out the easiest way possible to logically say, okay, this is the way to build the board. So mm -hmm. I went through and figured out what seems to be the fastest way to build the board and then tried to number the pieces that way, but also in ways that the numbers are associated with the way each piece looks. 
are there numbers on the bottoms of each piece for each each quadrant or each square? There's not. And there, mm -hmm. is there a number on the bottom for each one of those uh, puzzle pieces? You just had to memorize the shape with a with a number, then basically, right? A little bit. I don't. Not I. Part of the reason that I am doing this, so, yeah, a part of the reason I'm releasing it so limited and in at uh, like a like a higherish price point, although really for the work that goes into these, I'm like, no, I oh, it's I a really good price point. Um, but it's because it's the secret of how it works, and I want to try to keep right. that as long as possible, with the understanding, of course, that there are no secrets that really last in magic, but um, and I've already talked, I have people that are going to be mass producing it and are very interested in mass producing it, but I want to go wait a few years down the road and let these be special and what they are for those that How, many, them. how many are you going to re, uh, produce that each, each puzzle is different? How many, I mean, so that each one is a unique item. How, how many of those are you going to make? I mean, Technically, I think I could, I could make, well, are you talking about just the tour aspect? Because then if you want to start talking about the different finishes and the different, the, those different options, that makes it almost unlimited. But if you're just talking tour options, map options, and like the actual build of the board that every single board is built of the same materials and looking the same way, I have over 150 options. Um, I, I, at some point, am going to get tired of making them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yep. um, I wanted to say I'm limiting it to 50 boards or I'm limiting it to 100 boards, but everyone I've talked to is like, Sarah, don't limit it because you don't know. I don't, you know, I may discover that I love making these and I might find that, oh, I want to start using um like wood etching on them and decorate you know i don't know if if you limit them then you need to number them they will be numbered and i am getting a um uh, want to burn what a uh, brand saw the branding iron so each stand will be branded with my logo it'll be signed by me and numbered um that's great that's great then it's a real work of art yeah yeah and because each one really is customized. And that's really what I wanted to do with this was, was let it be art. Because I knew that if I was going to sit out and knock out a hundred boards that are just kind of all the same boards. This could be like, this could be like Van Gogh. You sell them for 500 and they're 80 million later on, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, cause I will, there will be a point. I, I don't know. I don't know if I'll, I don't know if I'll get to a point that I'm going to say, I'm going to cut off my waiting list. And I'm not taking any more names because I'm just, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I will say if you get on the waiting list, I will make your board. I'm not going to have anyone on the waiting list that I say, no, I'm not doing the board. And I cannot imagine wanting, like making a, over a hundred of these because it is so time consuming. Yeah. So yeah. like, it is, I, don't quote me on this. I know we're recording, but I can almost guarantee you it will be a run of at least, of definitely less than 100. And I'm thinking like 50. But I, I just don't know until I really start getting into the process at what point. Because I did want to price them low enough that the bulk of people that really want them and then doing it so that you get on the waiting list and pay a little bit at a time. But with it being how low I priced it, at some point, once it's not enjoyable to me anymore, it's not worth it <laughs> because of the materials and, and the time that go into it. And then I'm so lucky that because my dad is an amazing woodworker. He does these epoxy pour tables and just, I, I was the boy that my dad never had and wanted. And so I learned all of the things that he felt like were boy things. And um, so I have access to two amazing wood shops and that's where I get to do all the work. 
and um, yeah, and there may be like, I'm playing with using Purple Heart, which is a word that I just love, but it's way more expensive. So like if somebody wanted a Purple Heart board, like there is going to be an upcharge to that. But I have to figure all of those things out. So that's still part of the process that I'm in. What kind of woods are you using? Um, this is ash and I guess that order some maple. Um, but really, I am just going to the our local lumber yard and hand picking wood that has attributes that I like. And then from there, I have the blocks. I cut all the blocks at once. And so you can choose from the woods I have available, which which woods you'd like. Or I can stain them. Um, but yeah, there's a few qualities that the wood has to have, but for the most part, it can really be any wood. And so it's just going with, you know, whatever colors or it, it, then it gets to be art, you know? And so I get to sit down with everybody and say, well, what, what do you like? And I'm not going to, I, once I have figured out what my options are, then I'm going to make like the little three piece of like all the different options. So that instead of I'm instead of these huge boards to choose from, you can, you know, I can have these smaller pieces that you can play with. And it may be that I even will get to the point that once you, you know, put down your 50% and you've customized your board, I'll, I'll make one piece and send a single piece and say, is this, you know, what you imagined? And then I can make the other pieces and send the rest. Um, but that's literally an idea that just came to me as I'm talking, so I don't know if that's logical. At this point, you guys, I'm just chatting. So this is, that's every, like, and I'm fine to sit here and chat forever. I think my daughter is asleep. Hey, thank and I heard thank you. Thank you, uh, Sarah. This has been fun. Yeah, you should try to see if we, how many people remember those five. Uh... Yes, <laughs> yes. I was gonna say, go through and just don't say it out loud first. But everybody, think about where what you went to first, and if you can picture the location. Like you don't necessarily have to picture what's there, but if you know where you are, raise your hand. Like what we see first. Tower. And then now think about what's happening at the tower. Slamming doors. Uh huh. Slamming, flying doors. Jack, and what, in, the jack in the box. Yep. And that jack in the box is where is it in the picture? Spades. Lower right hand corner. Yeah. And so then, so you know that's your jack of spades. And then your doors that are flying up in your club, your full club. So location number two, what what do you see? Swan Lake. Yep. A crown. It's a heavy crown. And what crown. what else is she doing? The shrew's getting eaten. Yep. Down in the heart quadrant. So I'll move on to three. Crown on the swan's head. Yep. Yep. And the crown on the swan's head. That's in the club, club position. Yep. And your crown is what? King. Yep. So then you go to number three. What's number three? Um, Mountains. Yep. Oh, and I should There's be showing y'all these again when you're done. Yep, beehive. Oh, beehive. And, then, and then what's happening with the hive? They're getting chastised by angels. Uh-huh. An angel is from heaven, which is... Over building permits. <laughs> oh, yep. Seven of diamonds. Yep. All right. Four. The hand. I know, I know what it is. <laughs> and there's something resting under the hand. The shrew. 
Uh huh. And yeah, banshees. She's... Yep. And so Shrew is your two. She's in your heart quadrant. And your banshees are in your club. There we go, one up. So three clubs, two hearts. <clears throat> Number five. Waterfall. Uh huh. Stop sign. Yep. Which is the nine of spades. Uh huh. And then you've got your doors, which is four of hearts. Yep. That's ten cards. You just, I mean, you, it's ten cards. So no. it really, I mean, even if you took five locations a day and added five a day and then said, I'm going to review my five, now I'm going to review my ten. Even if you took five a week. I know people that have emailed me and said, I've tried for 10 years to memorize the stack. And I finally, like, this is what did it. Right. So even if you're taking one location a week for 52 weeks, that's a year. That's, a, that's, that's one picture. That's, you know, going to your tower and seeing your jack and your doors for an entire week. And in a year you have a stack, which is a heck of a lot faster than 10 years. But I think, I, I hope that I demonstrated tonight that it can be so much faster than that. And the biggest thing is don't put too much thought into it. Um, it really like, as soon as you start thinking, that is what's been messing me up with performing recently. And it's driving me crazy is because it's like, having that performance brain versus that that teaching brain where I'm constantly thinking about is there a better way to do this is there something I can change you don't want any of that <laughs> when you go to perform you want to just tunnel vision in and that's why I'm so glad that I'm now done with this download because I can be like all right I'm back to my original path and I can focus on getting rid of all of the extra that I've made for everyone else because that extra doesn't work for me. But what works for me isn't necessarily the most logical. Like I have for number 11, I had gas pump. To me, every time I go to 11, gas pump. But y'all aren't going to think of 11 for gas pump. Killers. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's a fun different cool. way to way to think and like like i think we saw there's there's no end to the combinations and i'm always excited to hear about ways that other people are thinking about it because everybody's going to come in uh, like into it from a different perspective and that's one of the things i've enjoyed so much about being you know a mnemonist versus a magician or a mentalist is that i get to cover kind of all of these different types of performance. And I get to learn and glean information from all these different things and put them together. And so the way different people look at these techniques is fascinating to me. And it's been so fun to put the amazing memory test out in the world with my master class and then watch the master class turn around and find ways to perform it. Uh, if you saw uh, In and of Itself, which everybody, uh, I know a lot of people have seen it, I, I watched it and I was so excited. The end, I'm assuming, do not know, but it's essentially the amazing memory test. And there are so many different ways you can hide memory in what you're doing. And I just, it builds and enhances everything but not just here like in the world of performance and every everything you do i was taking photos of documents today and then uploading them and i was having to go through and remember which ones had been uploaded and some had been missed and so i'm literally just going through my path and using my path instead of having to write down or jot and so i knew like okay well i skipped over this i skipped over this i skipped over this 
those are the ones I need to go back and take photos of. So there's just all these ways. And then once you know this, so that's one thing I didn't really get to talk about. And y'all aren't going to hurt my feelings if you leave, because really this is just me babbling at this point. But review is really important. The review doesn't have to be done all the time. Um, I start off the amazingest memory test down when talking about my first time back performing after being sick for two years. And that my first time performing the amazingest memory test wasn't me performing the amazingest memory test as a performance. I um, had gotten to the point I had, well, we didn't know it, kind of fluid on the brain. And um, there was a time I looked at a business card and I couldn't read it. Like the words made no sense. And it wasn't blurry. I just could not comprehend. And I knew that I was supposed to be able to comprehend it, but I couldn't. And eventually one word came into focus. It was will. And then from will, all the other words started. Again, I say focus, but it wasn't focus. I started to be able to understand them. So I ended up in a neurologist and the, the referral was I was sent to the neurologist for memory problems. And so the first thing they said they wanted to do was give me a memory test. And my friend Heather had taken me to the appointment and Heather kind of giggled. And, um, oh, cause I told, I told the, the doctor, I said, okay, but I won't cheat. And she said, she was like, what? And Heather giggles. And I was like, well, memory is what I do. And, you know, so I'm not going to use these methods. I will just try to remember this stuff naturally. And she said, oh no, whatever methods you have, use them. We want to know where you, what your baseline is. And so at this point, like Heather couldn't sit quiet. So she goes, she's like, she literally did a TED talk on memory. Like she, this is, her whole life is this stuff. And um, the doctor's like, no, just, it's, it's fine. Just use whatever tools you have. So she gave me a list of 10 objects and then a series of like seven numbers. And I had not reviewed my list in, I don't want to say over a year, but it was very possible that it had been over a year that I had been able to mentally go through and practice because I was just so incredibly sick. I couldn't think. And so I was just doing art. And um, so I was a little bit, a little nervous because I, I think part of the reason too, I wasn't practicing was I was afraid I couldn't do it. I was afraid I had lost it. And I was afraid that this life changing thing that is like literally my entire life that maybe that was gone too. And so I didn't practice at home and I, and I was afraid to go through and see if I still knew the stacks and, and, and I was just scared. And so the doctor said, well, use what you have. And so I went through and I, I knew it. I, I put it on a path. And this was before I started adding all these extra paths. And so, I mean, it was every time she would say a word, I'd say, okay, got it. Okay, got it. Got it. Got it. And so then she started getting a little more impressed. And so then she says, okay, well, let's go back to this list of objects. Um, tell me how many you remember. And I said, well, what, what order would you like me to give them back to you in? And she was like, what? I said, well, I can odds, evens, backwards, forwards, give me a random number. And she was like, huh? And I was like, so for example, this could, this is this, and this is this. And I ended up going through all of them in like random order for her and popping until I hit them all. And then did the same thing with the numbers. And it was so fun to watch her trying not to be blown away. <laughs> and when I read the doctor's notes later, and I keep meaning I need to find it and actually take a photo and share this. It says, um, they sent me for a brain MRI because I completely got a 100% score on everything for the memory. And they said, the wording was something along the lines of patient is so well studied that she, um, scored a, an almost above perfect score on the memory, on the, the test we gave her. <laughs> and so, yeah, it was just super, oh, and um, I have, I did realize I haven't told y'all about, um, I will go in and put my website in here because there are quite a few things that I talked about tonight. 
Although it's just my name, sarahcressman.com. Memorable. Or trust and creations. Those are both the same. They're the same. Um, I have a series of, well, three series of classes coming out in January. And those are on my website. If you go to memory and then there'll be a spot where you'll see classes. And if you click on those, you can go in and they'll show all of the, the three different classes. One is geared towards magicians. It's four classes. One is, all of them are four classes on the first four weeks of January. One is geared towards education and one is geared towards this general audience. And I have had a few magicians that have said, I can't make the magician class. So what we've talked about doing is going to the general class and then spending, um, right now I'm doing a sale for the rest of this week. That if you sign up for one of the classes, you get a free 30 minute one-on-one -on -one with me. And so in that 30 minute one-on-one, -on -one, we can talk about how to take the things we're learning in the general class and turn them into something for a show or performance. Um, so that's an option as well. The other thing that I pointed out was that the magician's classes are 200 for the four classes and the general classes are 100 for the four classes because they're not nearly as in depth as to like what the way you can really use this stuff. And um, so you could do the general class and then get an hour long session, one on one session with me, plus that free 30 minute one on one session. So then you have four classes and an hour and a half of one on one so we can break up in like three sections of 30 minutes or whatever. Um, and so that's an option too. So those are on my website. The books are on my website. Um, I'm about to hold up. My cards that got released, I think you can buy most anywhere. Um, but hopefully as of tomorrow, I will actually have my bricks of them. So you, as soon as I have enough of these, I will um, ha list them on my site as well, which hopefully will happen tomorrow. But they have the finagle and grid on the back. So you can mark them for flashcards just by marking the number. And then you have your flashcards. But they also have a tiny finagle and grid in the top. And so you could mark them as like a marking system. And then next to the Finaglian grid is those lolly and wheels I was talking about. And the way those are broken up, you could mark, if you didn't want, so you can mark your number here, your, your stack location number here, but then you could mark your actual card value and suit here if you wanted. And they are a one-way deck. There's a tiny North Star that makes them one way. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about, about these things out too, because it's a really great companion if you're trying to learn a stack to be able to have these. And if you know a stack and then have marked cards, it's like mind blowing, the kinds of things you can do. Um, knowing a stack because then if you have a card sitting there I mean if you're able to see the mark on your top card at any time you know what your bottom card is or what the next you know so I think stack work with mark cards is super fun so those are out as well and you can try them they're out through Murphy's awesome well, thank yeah, you, Sarah. I, You're amazing and just such yeah. a mind and brain you have. Just impressive. Well, thank you. I, I, um, I hope that I covered enough that it was like not too academic and had enough that everybody can find some way to use it within what you do. Because I know that, um, yeah, that's always a, a you know, my goal when I put these together is to cover enough that everybody is walking away with, with something that you're thinking about or. Yeah, I definitely. I'm always happy to answer questions. Um, email me, follow me on Instagram, follow me on Facebook. I just started using Instagram. Like I pulled up this old account that I had like hidden away forever and changed it around. And so that's all new for me, but I'm on Instagram and Facebook. When I say just started, I mean like in the past four months four or five months, not 
like yesterday. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording now. Yeah. And then. Hi, I just forgot you were still recording. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Hey, everybody. I got to run along. I have some stuff. I